Good morning. Good morning. It's Wednesday, February 28th, 2024. We are in day five of the state versus Hannah Gutierrez, the armor on the set of Rust, where Alec Baldwin fatally shot the cinematographer Helena Hutchins. Yesterday afternoon, we ended off with the star witness against Hannah Gutierrez being Hannah Gutierrez. Hannah's police interviews and body cam statements are what's coming into court right now. I know that the prosecution has a ton of witnesses left, but I'm surprised they didn't leave this to closer till the end because Hannah's interviews are damning. And I will put up a poll at the end of the interviews to see if your opinion of this defendant has changed based on her own words. Some of the things that were crucial to me is she acknowledges that safety concerns can come up on a set and it is her job she is supposed to check those and protect, protect against those. She said that she wished she had checked the rounds more. She said, I shake the dummies most of the time, the dummy round ammunition, most of the time. You're the armor on set. You're supposed to do it like three times or seven times when you need to do it two times. Most of the time is not all of the time. And most of the time seems like a very truthful statement. Why? because a live round ended up in a gun on set. Sure, her demeanor is uh, relaxed, kind of joking. It's, um, it's, it's something to watch. And this is in the second interview with her attorney after she knows, A, Helena Hutchins is dead, and B, how the public feels about it. These videos are very difficult for her. Her attorneys have had these since they were done, her attorney was sitting in the room when this happened and she made quite a lot of admissions. And the thing about speaking to the police and the thing about uh, being read your Miranda rights is they say anything in court can and will be used against you. You are going to watch how the prosecution uses statements like, um, I hate myself that, that this happened and um, this is the worst fucking day of my life. Those statements are going to be twisted into the prosecution's argument that this is not her feeling bad for her. This is her knowing how guilty she is. This is not just self-loathing and I had a bad day at work. This is guilt. And these are admissions of guilt. These are immediate state of mind admissions of guilt because she knows it was her job to prevent this from happening and it happened. So when they say anything can and will be used against you in court, it absolutely will. And it will be used against you in the light least favorable to you. In her interview, she also seems to present, and this is my summary, as she perceives herself as a badass bitch. Now, as a 24-year-old, I was already a district attorney. I was in a high demand profession, a high responsibility profession. I also viewed myself as a badass bitch. And so I understand when she's saying, I have a strong personality. She said that in her interviews. How, and I did not watch these interviews before the trial because I didn't want to know what was happening. I didn't want to know what was coming. I wanted to watch it with you. I was ready to go on this roller coaster with y'all. But when she is presenting herself as a vocal, badass armorer, as a woman with a strong personality, how in the world is her defense attorney's argument that she was a helpless, powerless woman in this industry? How is that the argument that you're going to take after watching her say in her own words that that's not true? Because now the attorney and her are fighting each other. Her own words are fighting her attorney because the way she's presenting herself is not the way her attorney is presenting her. And we know sometimes bravado is there to overcome the fact that we are ultimately not the ones in power. But that nuance isn't going to play to the jury when at the end of the day, she's the armor and it's her job to check the bullets that go into the gun. And she says things like, I wish I would have checked them more. I'm a very strong and vocal personality and I shake all of the dummies most of the time. So this morning we have about two more hours of, um, of, of, of interview. I switched uh, feeds today to hope that we could take advantage of whatever closed captioning we got. I don't know how the jury's going to feel about her after this interview. 
I don't know how you're going to feel about her after this interview, but I'll ask if your opinion changed. Just as a reminder, uh, for those of you that may be new to the chat, I do not uh, put up opinions of guilt or innocence until the close of evidence. The jury's not allowed to decide now. I choose to not decide now. I want to hear the rest of the evidence. But I will say my perception of this case has shifted, and I have a lot of questions. And I very much wonder why the defense attorneys were arguing that it was Sarah Zachary that emptied out the weapon Baldwin had when in Hannah Gutierrez's interview, she says that she checked it, that she had it after Baldwin had it, that she emptied it and she put everything on the cart. You know what else was on the cart? Live rounds were on the cart. Live rounds were on the cart. She said she corrected the police, by the way. She corrected the police in her interview. One of the officers said, Two people got shot, and she's like, no, I checked the gun. Only one round was missing. She knew it was a through and through and then a shot from one bullet. She just didn't know the order of how people were standing because she wasn't in the church. But she said she emptied the gun. The defense attorney, I now believe, the defense attorney has misled us, and I am now less than pleased because your client's statements have proven to me that something you told me in your opening is not true. Why, why are you lying to me? Why are you lying to me that Sarah Zachary emptied that gun and destroyed evidence and threw it away when your client says to the police, she emptied the gun and put the rounds back on the cart and live rounds are found on the cart? Sir, that misstates the, that misstates the evidence. And I am not pleased about it. Uh, we're going to roll back into court. I'm going to see if we can 1.25 the best that we can. Hopefully that summary was helpful. I didn't think I'd be uh, this outraged this morning. I'm only halfway through my coffee. And my hair's not even dry yet. It's been that kind of day. For all of you that showed up to the podcast premiere and chatted with me about the Petito Laundry case, thank you so much. We did a little bit of a tailgate before court. Um, so I might be a little hot still from that case coming into this case. So I'm going to take a breath. You're going to take a breath. We're going to take a breath. We're going to get to court and um, let's roll on. It's good to see you day five of trial. And um, I have more questions than I did at the beginning. I have so many questions. Hey there, I'm Emily D. Baker, the Internet's go to legal analyst, breaking down the legal side of the pop culture and entertainment stories we can't stop talking about. I'm a big fan of the cursey words. I've been a licensed attorney for over 17 years, but this is not legal advice. This is where the law nerds unite to talk about facts, not <laughs> Let's get into it. This is why the prosecutor, by the way, looks like the cat that ate the canary because this prosecutor has seen these videos multiple times. Everyone in their office has seen them multiple times. They know what's coming. Uh, they are well aware that all of this is about to unfold. Let me bump my audio real quick. Uh, the prosecutor is well aware of what's going to unfold. And um, of course, they look... Emily, get it together. All right, you may be seated. Good of, morning, jurors. Of course they look corrupt. All right, you're still under oath. Okay. Okay, that... The screen share has not been working, um, ideally, which I think my computer is tired of trial. I'm like, it's only day five. Like, this is a marathon, not a, not a sprint. Let's keep going. There we go. <clears throat> yes. Uh, okay, we'll go ahead and uh, resume the video at one hour and five minutes. This video is resuming at one hour and five minutes in. They said this was a two to three hour video. So we'll see. Um, we'll see. Oh, but look, look. We have a Mr. Bullion sighting. This is right as everybody's about to start. He's kind of sliding into council table. We know he's there. They didn't let him quit. Um, but I haven't seen him in this courtroom. This courtroom, by the way, by the time we get to uh, by the time we get to Baldwin's trial, this courtroom is going to be very full. So. <coughs> that is so peaky let me turn down i've gained up audio let me turn down what i've gained up just to hope we can cut some of that peakiness uh attorneys in the future 
if you can have a sound professional run this through, um, that would be helpful to you. Just to reset, we have the interviewers in the room with Hannah Gutierrez and her lawyer, Mr. Bowles. That made me not like horses. Horses and friends just suck. Uh, uh, Does she look nervous being interviewed by police? To you? Um, Hannah, are you a certified firearms instructor? Uh, I don't know. Okay. Have you ever taken like any courses? Damn it. Today is going to be a long day. Are you a certified firearms instructor? I, d I don't know. Yesterday, um, yesterday she said that her training was her dad and Seth Kinney. So are you a certified, are you a certified firearms instructor? I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I feel like I had more training to be a lifeguard when I was 16 uh, than she's had. Is there anything to become an instructor? No. Okay. Did um, you do yeah, anything really to become sure an instructor? No. For this. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if that's required for this. I'm not sure if being a certified firearms instructor is required for this. I can't wait to see Ian Runkle, who is a firearms expert. Um, and I can't wait to see his summary of this of this bit. I had no idea. I had no idea that you could go on to set, be responsible for weapons, be responsible for actors' safety with the weapons, and not be a certified firearms instructor. Wow. Might not be, but more just you know, be your back. And I'm <clears throat> I'm sorry, Corporal. I I myself couldn't hear what kind of an instructor you were asking her about. Can, can you summarize that? Yeah, so I asked her if she was um, a certified firearms instructor. Ex excuse me, Corporal. Can you summarize that she has literally no fucking training, like no formal fucking training at all? Could you just make sure the jury heard that? It's early, um, and they might not have finished their coffee yet. Okay, thank you. I can slow it down. Yeah, yeah, totally. yeah. this kind of stuff. Yeah, no, mostly just trained with my dad. My dad, like, probably wouldn't send me to go train with someone else exactly, you know. Makes sense. Yeah, he is kind of the industry. Um, so as far as... I'm never going to make it through today. Yeah, my, my, my dad wouldn't send me to go train with someone else. He's kind of the industry. He's kind of the industry. So if uh, if anyone wants to have a conversation about nepotism in Hollywood, um, I feel like maybe this case is going to become a uh, a case study. The accidental on set. Oh, my video did freeze. That's weird. Can I, can I just say Hold on, my video did freeze. I know you guys have audio. Let me try this one more time. Uh, so it doesn't, let's see. And if it, if it won't stop freezing, I'm going to have to switch feeds. Let's see if that's better. Okay. So I think we're on the are, are we good on hearing? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, no, my, October my screen was frozen. Okay. She's so not moving that much, actually, though. They both occurred within 10 minutes of each other. So they were on the same day. They were on the same day and it was. She's talking about the accidental discharges. Because she was letting someone else load her guns. I wonder what the prosecutor's Starbucks order is. Um, she's talking about the accidental discharges that would happen within 10 minutes of each other. Those were accidental firing of blanks. That's why there was a loud noise. That's why they're that's why they were worried. The Dolly Grip was worried about the horses being spooked on set, which could have caused a ton of injuries. Like, depending on the load of the blanks, you don't shoot the like full load or half load blanks around horses. Horses are kind of known to be jumpy and large. Oh, but um, she called the horses weird animals yesterday and threw Jensen Eccles under the bus. So uh, I'm gonna just take some deep breaths. Chaotic for okay. that little bit. Um, but anyway, so I go to the bathroom. It's the first time I've been able to step off of set. Cleopatra, that happened yesterday. Um, I think it's like four, Four or two, maybe three o'clock. Um, finally get to step off set. Why I'm on the toilet the and all of a sudden I hear some screaming in my earpiece. I'm on the toilet. I'm hearing screaming in my earpiece. Why is anyone handling the guns when you're on the toilet? And I'm like, what the fuck is that? And then I hear Dave say, it's okay, everyone. It's just a misfire. And I 
I like go, what the fuck? So I run out of the bathroom with my pants halfway down. Um, I'm running to set, trying to figure out what happened, and I walk up to set, and Sarah's, like, loading the guns, and I'm like, hey, like, how's it going? And she's all like, oh, good, um, I was like, what happened? She's like, nothing, really, can you load the one in there? And I say, okay, I'll go in there, and I'll load that one, because I had been loading that Henry with that. Oh, with that my God. For quite some time now, probably, like, most of the day. Um, so I go in there. And Oh, y'all are asking about what happened with Jensen. So at the end of the interview yesterday, she was talking about uh, the fact that the actors were just like wandering around set with guns and that Jensen left his gun at like the snack cart. Um, however, Jensen seems to be super conscientious about the use of weapons and the armorer's job is to immediately after the actor is done on camera using the weapon it is their job to take it and secure it safely so my perception is that the armorer was not around for jensen to hand off his gun to and that is why it ended up at the snack cart i load it with him i load that one with what him are you guys and I drinking him, this morning all right so i Cold say brew. I said, all right, you got about 13 quarter or half loads in there. I can't really remember what it was for that particular scene. That might have been, the actors were outside, so those were probably quarters. So I tell him you have about 13 quarter loads in there. And he said, is there one in the chamber? And I said, yes. And he said, okay. And I said, okay. So don't touch the trigger. And he was like, okay. And I walk out. And then I go up to Sarah and I said, hey, uh, what happened? And she was like, I was like, I heard there was like a misfire, which is like the wrong terminology for it even. That's an accidental discharge. Um, so I was like, I heard there was like a misfire or something. And she's like, uh, yeah, I was loading it. And she's like, and it just went off. And I said, because I had to train her. And I said, bitch, guns don't just go off. Why are you loading it? I'm the armorer. No one should touch the fucking guns but me. This is day five trial, Emily. I'm tired. Um, this interview has has put me into the anger category. Um, but she is a great witness for the prosecution. Or how to do, how to put them in and make sure that the hammer goes down gently enough. Because I asked her if she knew how to do that from Seth. And she's like, yeah, but let me just do it again a couple of times in front of you. And I saw her do it. And I was like, no, no. I was like, put your thumb all the way over the trigger. I mean, not the trigger, the hammer. Otherwise, you know, if you don't put it all the way over, your hands will be sweaty sometimes and it'll slip. And so she was loading it. And I'm not exactly sure what happened. Like I said, I was in the bathroom. But guns don't just go off like that. Um, and if you're loading it, it's most likely that you made a mistake just loading it and that the hammer came down too quick. Okay. And, you know, when I'm you're in a rush, the hammer that down. can happen. It hasn't happened to me, but I can understand it happening. When you're in a rush, that can happen. It hasn't happened to me. You're the armor. No one else should be loading the guns. So it shouldn't happen to anyone because the people loading the guns should be trained to handle the guns and the head of props is not trained to handle the guns. That's why there's an armor on set. Um, and then as soon as that had happened and I walked outside and I was asking her about that, next thing I know, boom, inside of the fucking thing. And I already told him this gun was hot. I know for a fact I did and we were doing that scene all day. So this man knows this gun is hot. Hot means it has blanks in it because they do put out powder. They do make a noise. So hot means blanks in it. Baldwin's lawyers have seen this and haven't negotiated a plea. Baldwin's lawyers have seen this and are like, you know what? What's going to happen? This 24 year old fucked up and this was not Baldwin's job. So no, they're not going to plea. They're going to they're going to show the Baldwin jury this and be like. Her. And then I go in there and I said, what the fuck are you doing in here? And he tells me, he's like, I don't know, it just went off. And I was like, well, it's a lever action rifle, and that's not really how that works, bud. You know? So, he pissed him off a little bit, but I said, all right, be careful in here. Thankfully, we were doing that scene pretty much all day, so I think a lot of camera had their earplugs in, but...
It was inside when it went off, though? It was inside of this, yeah, little shack that they were in, and most of the camera crew was in there at the time. Okay. It sounds like two different weapons went off, um, that somebody else was loading a the lever action, and that Sarah Zachary was loading something else. It seems like two different people were loading weapons on set within 10 minutes of each other, and she was just like, meh. Yeah, so that one was inside, and then there was also a pop or misfire with special effects. Okay. Yeah, and that was uh, really? that was the day that was the day that we first started shooting and everything. We Tell didn't. Me more. We had pretty good luck with that. Every time, you know, we got done with the scene, I count all the shots, so I know if there's still a hot gun on set. So I was looking for that, and most of the time, I would just run to the actor and be like, "Don't touch it. It's hot still." Her hair has changed quite a bit before interviews. Um, the chat is asking because uh, reasons, and I want to make sure it's clear. Kyla asks, is this after Helena died? Yes. This is not just after Helena died, but this is after Helena died and after um, and after the, like the beginning of kind of the discussion about this case. Okay. Yeah. Um, chat, as always, you are delightful. Sarah's gun went off. Is that possible if you, like, drop the hammer too quickly that it can discharge? Yeah, totally. That's the revolver. Yeah, it wasn't like the trigger. Uh, yeah, no. That happens. That happens. Okay. If you, well, see, that's the thing. No, so you have to pull the trigger in order to bring that hammer all the way down, you know? So you have your finger on the hammer, and in order to get the hammer to release back to a position where the person could grab it and do the scene... You have to put your, you have to touch the trigger and slowly lower the hammer down. If you touch the trigger, it'll just send the hammer down. So if your finger isn't there to stop it while you're loading it, it's going to come down and shoot it. So these, I mean, now I understand why that can, ha I mean, that can everybody has said so that it happens often, of this kind of stuff. So I that that, that was, totally can happen often, and it's just because ultimately you do have to lower down that hammer again in order to start the scene. You can't, like, give it to the actor, like, cocked back and everything, you know? So, yeah, and it's... it's and that's why the a actors need of, training. Um, like, even my 22, I have to do that as well. You know, like, I'll bring it back. There's, like, a little piece that stays back, and unless I hold that and slowly release it while holding my trigger, that would go off, too. Interesting. And so I even my Walter P. About even my, well, and that's just my Walter P. Twenty Two. That's not a revolver. Like that's just a regular like magazine. In order to load these, does the hammer have to be back? It has to be half cocked. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. So yeah, and then you have to bring it back all the way, or like kind of you can you can bring it back from a half cock, kind of, but it helps to bring it back all the way and just bring it down slowly. Okay. Um, after the interview style of this uh, police detective is very effective with this witness and I think effective with Baldwin. It's the it's kind of a, oh, I, I, I don't really know. I'm just trying to figure it out. Just explain to me everything you know. And do you see how much Hannah Gutierrez is talking to explain everything that's happening to this officer? She is talking and talking and talking and talking. There was an officer I worked with who had a very gentle interview style and he's like, Hey, I just need, I really don't understand how this could have happened to you. He says to the person he's arrested, can you just like explain to me what went down? Like, I, I just don't get it. He was just such a calm dude and people would just tell him literally everything because he was so unassuming and so, so, um, patient and compassionate. It can be a very effective interview technique to, be like, we're just here for a chat and just let them talk. Don't interrupt, which I would suck at doing. And just let them explain it to you. Let them talk. Let them teach you everything. However, her attorney seems to be taking notes because he's never heard this story before, which is wild. Both of those uh, accidental discharges. Wild. What happened? So... And then there's this, this other guy. is kind of when Sarah sure. and I butt heads. Um, because ultimately, like, after hers, I was livid. And then after that one, I was, like, furious. Um, and so I tell her, I was like, no, dude. I was like.
having issues with Sarah Zachary. They were butting heads. She's livid after the misfires. And what just happened? And like, I'm getting heckled by the fucking stuntmen at this point. Um, I said, no, dude, that like wasn't okay. We need to talk to production about this because a lot of people are probably pissed about that mm -hmm. because it happened within 10 minutes of each other, two of them. And I was like, oh my God, I literally screamed out, what the fuck is happening? Um, <laughs> I screamed what the fuck is happening, but then we never had a safety meeting and it never really got addressed. The stuntmen shouldn't have been heckling you. They should have been like, excuse me, you're the armorer. What is happening on this set? I imagine that was not uh, heckling, but that was uh, safety concerns. I think that was probably safety concerns. Um, but so I told Sarah, I was like, hey, we need, we should probably talk to production about that. And like Sarah is embarrassed at this point. She's shaking. Her face is like pretty mad. Um, it's not her job she's to not load really the guns. responding to me too much. She's, I said, I said, well, like you know, you did that while loading it, and I was like, so I'm not sure if people are gonna want you loading the guns anymore. And she was like, well, yours just went off in there after you loaded it. And I said, yeah, well, I can't be responsible for every dickhead fucking stunt guy that gets a hold of the gun and doesn't understand the concept that it's hot. Right. I can't be responsible for every dickhead stunt man who gets a hold of a gun. Ma'am, ma'am, you in fact are responsible. Also to all the stunt people, I wonder if this is why um, they were frustrated with her on set. She seems to have a positive working relationship with others on the crew but literally your job is to be responsible for everyone who has a gun in their hand that it, you had one job you had one job you had one job and why are you throwing the stuntman under the bus you know and she was like all right well so we'll go ahead so she, i was like we need to talk for, to production i'll let you talk to them i'm not trying to get us in trouble here i'm just saying like we need to mind this because a lot of people are probably pissed and the next thing I know, I get a text from Seth. Um, so she was there. She was like mad, angry texting. And I thought she was probably talking to the producers. And the next thing I know. We better see those texts next. Like the texts better be next after this video is done. Now I get a text from Seth. And Seth tells me, uh, Sarah told me about her accidental miss, like her accidental discharge. It was an accident. Accidents happen. You need to get over it. And I said. Accidents shouldn't just happened somebody remind me why seth kinney's not charged again i'm gonna need help figuring it out later she should be pissed about it over it i was like what are you talking about i said i'm not making a big deal about this i was like i'm not going to production to rat on her i don't know what the fuck you're going on about so there was nobody from production in the area so. i think there was people from production in the area i think there were like two uh, the regular chunk, chubby producer, he was there, and I think Nathan might have even been there. They were there, there a lot. Um, no one said anything. Sarah apologized on the spot, I guess. Um, I didn't really apologize uh, for that because I'm just trying to figure it out at this point, and I don't know what that guy did. Uh, um, I don't even know his name. I think his name was Blake. Belay. Yeah, he. They also didn't have me train him at all with the gun, and he's Alex's stunt double, mind you. So you know, if you didn't train him with the gun, it is your job to ensure that he doesn't touch the gun. Alex, Alex's stunt double. So he probably should have at least been trained, but also. Is she calling Alec Baldwin Alex? Like Alec? I think she. I don't know. I think she's done that a couple times. Um, Alan, the stunt coordinator, was like, all oh my guys know what the fuck they're doing, so don't worry about them. So, yeah. Um, this interview is appallingly bad for her, and I, I'm going to have to stop stopping or we're never going to get through it. But um, if the... I can't picture somebody saying, all oh my guys know what they're doing, so they don't need any training. Don't get to work with that guy. And me, back to, like, the set thing, um, I went up to Sarah about it, and I was like, hey, I texted her, and I was like, I'm sorry if you thought I was trying to start problems about this. I was just trying to say that we should tell production because 
I don't want, like, I wouldn't be surprised if we both got fired for that. I wouldn't, like, you know, we need to make sure that everyone still feels comfortable after that. And she said, um, right. She and said, no, I understand. Been. Maybe you should have um, been fired. I contacted Gabby and Roe about it. And I told, went ahead and told Seth, and I apologize to everyone on the spot, and I think they're going to just... Also, yes, this is levels of hearsay. It's They're not admitting it for the truth of what the other party said, because this is like, so-and-so told so-and-so, so so-and-so told so-and-so. It is um, it, it is multiple levels of hearsay. It's not being offered for the truth. It's being offered for her, um, her state of mind and what happened in the fluidity of her interview. Move past this and move by it, and I was like... Okay, cool, as long as you contacted the producers. Okay. But Other you didn't that... ever see her actually contact them? No, no, I didn't. Uh, and also, uh, at that point, I had already pissed her off, and she went to Seth about it. So I wasn't going to fuck with that anymore, and I just let her handle it. Okay. Because you ultimately, to to she... Yourself. No, because she was my boss and already was a... Yeah. Okay. Um, to your knowledge, do you know of any reports being made about those? I have no idea. Okay. Yeah, I uh, have been wondering recently if she did talk to them, and no one from production talked to us about it, which I thought was pretty weird. You know, like no one even said, like, all right, guys, like, you know, pick your, get your shit together. Like, no one said anything. It is us, pretty weird, ma'am. Directly. It is real weird. It was, um, real weird. Nobody said anything about two so when Sarah fires on off, set. What happened? At the, did you take the gun after that, or what happened with it after? Uh, after that, you know, we just had to keep loading it for the stunt guys, and ultimately, uh, after hers went off, I didn't exactly have the option. We had three people that needed to be loaded right then. Okay. So I didn't exactly have the option to take Sarah off of guns that day, and also she is my boss, so I'm she not allowed to take to her off of guns. Yeah, she does continue. To Bullshit. Oh, sorry. Um, no, not sorry. Bullshit. You're the armorer. It doesn't matter that she's the head of props. You absolutely have the authority to take anyone off of guns. However, you shouldn't have to have taken Sarah Zachary off of guns because Sarah Zachary's not the armor and she should have never been touching the guns ever. If this prosecution team does not bring in an expert armorer to explain how bad all of this is, I don't know if a jury will know. They'll pick up on her attitude. They'll pick up on other things, but they might not necessarily know that the armor does in fact have the power to say and should say to everyone else, no one touches the guns but me. And if you do touch the guns and you are not me, you are off of this set because that is the type of power that the armorer needs, but they need someone who is a professional armorer to come in and explain it. And her attorney is just like, yeah, I mean, that was her boss. What are you going to do? Okay. Even after that. Yeah. After her discharging. Um, who unloaded them that day? Unloaded them from the blanks? Yeah. Both of us. Okay. Yeah. And we unload them as we get them in from the actor as soon as they're done doing the scene. Both of you us? Them? Yeah. After Helena was killed, both of you? Cool. Pretty much any big N NBD. gun battle in this entire thing, we were both loading and unloading the guns. Okay. What about the, the special effects that wow. squib or whatever that went off? It was like a popper. Um, I'm not sure if they had a squib go off. I never saw that. Um, it's like a popper. It's like a thing that hangs from the ceiling, and it's filled with, like, little debris and things like that. But they were all supposed to go off for a scene, and one didn't go off, and then, like, maybe... Two minutes after the scene, it just, like, randomly went off, and people were like, oh, shit. But we were outside, so it wasn't too bad, you know? Were you present? In, so you weren't present when it went off? The popper? Yeah. I was present. Okay. I was out. I feel like she hasn't figured out that she's, like, the most responsible person on set yet. And while production's also responsible and Baldwin is also responsible, she's the one who loaded the weapon. So I don't think she's figured out that, that that's, like, why the police are talking to her outside and I was a little uh, like maybe 20 feet away from it okay. I wasn't directly on the porch so a lot of people on the porch were obviously freaked out but I was pretty far away okay yeah when guns go off you on know, the set that aren't supposed to people are freaked out that one uh, I'm for that popper screaming oh I have no idea 
I know. Especially if it's not my department. I wouldn't really know about it. I didn't make any reports. I mean, at least she's not um, playing with ammo during this interview. I'm That's just going to confirm were guns ever taken good. out after hours on lunch, on days off. These, are, these guns absolutely were locked up every single moment. That me and Sarah were not there, to my knowledge. Okay. Um. These guns were locked up every moment. Sarah and I weren't there. Sarah's not in armor, to my knowledge. How are you not certain about this? How are you not certain? And it's also not true because earlier in this interview, you were saying, oh, but you know, Jensen left a rifle or whatever over at the snack cart. So it's actually not true. You've contradicted yourself within your own interview. I, I don't necessarily know that the prosecutor is going to wrap all that together, but um, that's not true. And I'm including lunch every day. Okay. Then mm -hmm. how did it end up at the snack cart? That, um, accidental also, law enforcement's not going to cross-examine her on these things. They're not going to point out her inconsistencies and let her fix it. They're going to let it stay fucked up and let the lawyers argue it later. They're never going to try to fix it for her. And unless it is absolutely critical, they're not going to pin down those inconsistencies. They're going to note them and let her continue to um, knot the rope for herself like they're just giving her all of the rope to see what she's going to crochet with it that was like so many mixed analogies i'm sorry it was terrible Sarah, i know you said that you weren't there you were in the bathroom yes um i was there for the second one okay what is it that man and is it okay for you to walk off when they have um uh, it's like, okay news? sometimes you know like i said i was we were doing a lot of gun battles that whole entire day, and ultimately there was only two people shooting at the time, and I told Sarah, I was like, I need to use the bathroom right now or I'm literally going to piss my pants. And I told Dave that I was going to the bathroom too. So I tell them... You know, when they're training for, for Lizzo's music videos, um, they actually do just piss their pants. They, they don't make a big deal. I'm teasing. I'm teasing. It's not okay. Hollywood is a weird place. I step off, I step off, and they know that. Okay. Because ultimately, you know, you can't. Hold Darcy, thank you for the super chat. I did see George Clooney's interview uh, ripping into Alec Baldwin. Other actors have definitely made statements that Baldwin should have checked the weapon. Um, this is definitely a preview of what we're going to see against Baldwin. This is not good for him. So. Sometimes. Right. Yeah. Sarah just said she was not uh, and licensed. And it really sucked that day, too, because the bathrooms were, like, far as shit. <laughs> All right. We're going to go. Uh... There was a cut there in the interview. They said it was edited. It annoys me when it's when certain things are redacted and they don't make it a clearer redaction. Okay. Okay. So the box of ammo that you pulled from that day. Yeah. Um... Box of dummies. Right. Where did you pull that box from? Um, so that box, it was kind of peculiar, actually. Um, now that I've thought about it a little more. Because we have been looking. Well, Chicago Doll, if the prosecution is keeping tabs, A, they will learn that this is the best chat on the internet and not toxic and that this chat is trying to keep an open mind, but that our empathy and compassion is um, being buried under this interview. Uh, and, and, you know, you never know what they may come up with. But I also have been a lawyer for like 18 years. Hopefully they're watching the legal coverage of it because I know other lawyers have found that helpful in their trials to get ideas from the things that we put together. The more eyes on a case, sometimes the more helpful. For the 45 long cold so high. And we had, had a lot of them because, like I said, we used up all of, a lot of mine at the beginning, if not all of them. And so we had to order some 4440s, which are kind of a, a similar size. And then we did get some 45 long colts a little before that, um, probably before that weekend. And we put all of, pretty much all of that entire box in Travis Flamel's uh, gun belt. Okay. Travis Flamel's gun belt? Who is Travis Flamel? And does he know Nicholas? Yeah. And then, so this box, I haven't been aware of any more long colt boxes and everything. And this box was kind of just sitting I mean, we uh, are the top coverage right the next to my safe. 
on like this kind of extra bag that I bring to carry guns in. Okay. Yeah, and so I thought it was kind of weird. Looking back at it now, it was kind of just like sitting on top of my stuff. And considering the prop truck got moved over the weekend, I don't know like how easily that would have stayed up there. And this box was there in the morning. Can you elaborate? Hello, Mr. Bowles. <laughs> now you have questions. You want her. He's now directing her interview to um, ask more questions. But they're talking about the prop truck moving and maybe shit falling over um, while the prop truck got moved. <sighs> when you get up there, because I think it's a significant issue. Right. Yeah. yeah. One of the original boxes that were provided, though. No, and it was weird. I think it just said dummies on it. Like, okay. nothing else. I saw just the word dummies This on whole it, interview. I could remember. Which is not the regular font I'm used to seeing on it, either. So, I'm sorry, ma'am. What you're telling law enforcement is that that box of ammo looked out of the ordinary to you that that box of ammo looked weird to you. So if that box of ammo looked weird to you, did you consider maybe checking it more? Because it looked odd. And if any of you watch um, defense attorney Bruce Rivers, he's the criminal defense attorney, um, and you ask yourself, what is the problem with self-snitching? This trial is going to be a, a prime example because this is a very difficult case to prove. And this case becomes, I think, very difficult to prove without these admissions. <laughs> these interviews um, make this case a case where prosecutors are like, we're going to go to trial. We're going to go to trial. We're going to go to trial. And whatever the defense attorney says, we don't really care because at the end of the day, we're going to play these videos. And that's it. And that's it. It's up in your bag. And, and, yeah. And, it's propped up in my bag, uh, you know, just like sitting on top of stuff, like not falling over in the bag, you know, because it was on top of something. So, like, it seems weird that it wouldn't have fallen over while moving. Oh, I do owe you guys a bing. We'll do that. Uh, in the break. It, was, it was like a, it was either above a Smith & Wesson bag. I don't know if you guys saw that. It's like it said Smith & Wesson, and I marked it out with Sharpie so that way people wouldn't rob my car. Um reality backhand i appreciate the moments of levity in a heavy trial reality backhand uh thank you for the super chat i've learned that for this trial i identify as a 45 long colt revolver in order to discharge i have to be depressed or and depressed and fully cocked thank you <laughs> oh and then there's another black bag that i had too they were both like kind of there were two black bags kind of usually stacked on top of each other okay so that the box that you pulled out of that day though was on that bag yeah okay and it was just kind of sitting up there and i remember i was like looking for you know blanks to pull dummies to pull and i saw that box and i was like i was like exclaimed and i was like i was like where the fuck did this like box of dummies come from i was like have we had this the entire time? I was like, we've been needing these. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Nicole just laughed, and I don't really remember if Sarah was there or not, but I said... Wait, who's Nicole? Did we clear up who Nicole... I feel like I'm listening to my kid trying to explain to me drama at school right now um, with people whose names I don't know. Like, oh, well, whatever. At least we have them now. Put them on the cart, and they went out with Oh, us. oh, Stacy, okay. yes. And I... Oh, oh Stacy, Yes. Oh, yes, there are times in your career where you get a case and you're just like, oh, yeah, oh, yes. There are there are cases that you are like, you are going to trial. We will we'll tell some of those stories uh, in another day. I'm sure there's trials with defense attorneys when they know they've got the thing. They're like, you want to go to trial? Bet let's go to trial. Um, it, it is your career, but also most people who go into litigation tend to be competitive people. So when you know, when you know you've got a, a case that when you know the jury's going to see this thing and hate it, it becomes a, I don't care if this is a legally difficult case, we ride. So yes, yes, they do. Yep. As I picked them up, they were jingling. So that indicates that they were dummies. Okay. Had you seen the box prior to that point? I hadn't really noticed that box prior to that point, but I think I had noticed a box that looked similar to it that we had gotten those newer ones from. 
And I think I remembered like a box similar to that. Yeah, and when her dad testifies, it's going to be it wild. Might have been the same box, even. Okay. This was maybe because we didn't put those dummies back in there, though. But that's the only other box that looked like that box. Was one of those newer boxes that we got, and I think it just said like just dummies on it. Oh, now we take a pause. Yeah, a lot has happened. Corporal, based on your understanding of dummy rounds and how an armorer would check dummy rounds, um, based on your investigation, follow me. Is it including possible my to pens. determine that every round in a box is a dummy round if you just shake the entire box? No. Because if you just shake the box, how you, can you tell? I mean, yeah, you could more than likely hear some of them jingling, but it wouldn't be, um, you know, feasible to point out that every single one of those had BBs in it. Because you shook the whole so, box. Based on your interaction with Ms. Gutierrez Did she seem during to give this a part shit? of the interview, I just want to be clear. Was it your impression that, that, that she claimed that this was a box she'd never seen before? Yeah, that's what she stated. Um, so it was a box she'd never seen before and she just decided to grab it and start loading guns with it. Yes. After shaking the entire box. Yes. Not each round, the box itself. Correct, just the box. Right. Uh, this was a very good point to stop, but also, um, she said that it had like writing on it that she didn't recognize. Like the box looked out of place to her and she was still like, yeah, it's fine. Wild. I have egg bites that I'm going to eat. No so. lettering, anything of the sort. Yeah, the no, prosecutor no, is having a hard time not smiling. Anything like that. I think I just saw the word dummies. No, those are leading questions. Uh, I don't believe it did. It might have said long quote on the other side. I don't really remember. Okay. LC, maybe. All right. I don't know. So, um, at the beginning of the day, before lunch, how many guns were pulled out? Okay. <laughs> Can I have like a piece of paper or something? Just because like there's a lot of people in this, you know. Yeah, I have <laughs> so probably a few. There we go. I'm like, I feel like you're running out of paper. She confidently says to the police, can I draw you a diagram? Yes, ma'am. We'll let you do whatever you like. Um, Jensen character, wood, uh, drum. And we have a miller over here. And so these are the ones that were being used today. And also, I think Boone was coming in later that day, but I don't think we pulled his gun. So check this out. Miller has two pistols and a long rifle. Rifle. There we go. Russ has a pistol, a long barrel one, different than everyone else's really. Long barrel. And he also has a Henry rifle. Rifle. So at this point, that's, you know, that's like three guns, four, five. And then Wood has a gun, and he also has a long gun. So that's another pistol and another rifle. Oh, wait, he has a shotgun, my bad. And the drum also has a shotgun and a pistol. Okay. And those were all prior to lunch? These are all prior to lunch, yes. So I think that's a total of one, two, three, five pistols and four long guns, two shotguns. Okay. And if you would like, that's your. Um, so you might, you might need that. So. Okay. <laughs> she just literally said to the police, if you'd like to keep that, go ahead and keep it. That is how confident she is in this interview that she's like, that, that, that's for you. Wow. 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 They have made, she is so comfortable. She feels like she is the one in charge of this interview. Her lawyer is sitting there next to her, just taking notes. Like he's never heard any of this before. Um, and the primary interview is just like, tell me more, tell me more. And, and this is a, this is a disaster. Well, we can illustrate a little more. So she she doesn't think cool. it's a disaster, um, but it's a disaster it for her. It's Prior great for the prosecution. Yeah. So what you have to understand about 
before lunch is that Let we were at another location explain. for most for half of the day before lunch and then we had gotten done with that location and we moved up to the church okay right so during the I day don't know. um at Wait, the where'd i go i don't day, know none of those were dummied up at all because the shot was so wide you okay. just like wouldn't see it you there know what you know you know what's dummied up this interview this interview and mr bowles not um saying anything there was nothing in these until we got to the church okay which yeah. is but still prior to breaking to lunch can she yeah. try to so play now to breaking to lunch so, so if you had to break up the day no. like that you could split i mean she could like try it's not gonna happen into two things one where we were somewhere else entirely and nothing was dumbing up and after that uh we were in the church and things started to get dummied up and but weren't dummied up right away okay um so then which ones of these were loaded prior to lunch yes okay with dummies prior to lunch wood and drums pistols were dummied up sarah helped me dummy those up okay and uh, a little later on, the camera started getting in on Russ. And so Russ got his dummied up uh, maybe an hour and a half before lunch. Okay. Yeah. Anything with Miller? Miller was not in there. Okay. Yeah, so Miller's character was coming later the in the day. law enforcement um, letting yeah. her think so she's he in charge. not in charge at all. So yep. honestly, that's I'm good pretty sure that we put away his two pistols and his long rifle for a good proportion before lunch because we always try to put them away as we're not using them and lock them up. Okay. So the only ones dummied up though are the pistols? Yeah, three pistols. And they should have both been used at the time of the incident. Like they were both, all three of those were out there. Okay. So who loaded what gun? Uh, Sarah and I loaded woods and drums. I don't really remember who they are, identical guns. So you wouldn't really know. Um, okay. And then Russ, uh, I'm, I'm dummy that one up. Okay. Yeah. And all the dummy rounds. All the dummy rounds, yeah. And she is saying, no, no, I loaded the gun that Alec Baldwin had. I was in charge of dummying up the gun that Baldwin had. The gun that Baldwin had was my responsibility. She's clarified it over and over and over. So now the evidence is in. There is no question who loaded Baldwin's gun. It is very clear. She did. We were shaking them and checking them as we did it, yeah. Okay. And then some of them didn't have to be shaked, but yeah. She got her job because of her dad and Seth Kenny. And why didn't they have to be? They didn't have primer caps on them. And sometimes I accidentally still like And she said that in her interview. In them, just thinking that they're going to shake and then I like realize. The only time where I've ever like thought there was a bad one is like when I shake it and I don't hear anything. And then I realize I'm like, oh, it's the ones that don't shake. Can you recall? I'm sorry, you thought there were bad ones? You thought there were bad ones? Let's let's back up and hear what you thought about the bad ones and and how you didn't shake everything. Let's let's hear more about the bad ones that didn't shake on set. Like shake the ones with holes in them, just thinking that they're gonna shake and then I like realize. Yeah, that's the only time where I've ever like thought there was a bad one is like when I shake it and I don't hear anything and then I realize I'm like, oh, it's the ones that don't shake. Oh, so what she said, this is why I backed it up. What she said is, I will, she seems to be saying, I will shake them first. And then if I don't real, if it doesn't shake, I look at it and then there's a whole board in the side. And then I realize, oh, these are the ones that don't shake. But she's saying, I go to shake them first until I realize that they're the ones that don't shake. Oh, ma'am. When you loaded, whichever ones you loaded, um, what specific rounds you put in them? Yes. Okay. So this is Baldwin's gun she's talking Russ about now. Pistol, um, the wooden drum, I don't exactly remember those, you know. Uh, I think most of those, not exactly sure what was up with those. Um, but for the rust one, I remember I had four of them without primer caps okay. because I always try to use those ones ultimately. Uh, I have four of them without primer caps, and then I grabbed some dummies from that box, and I, like, brought them in there. And I was walking in with the, I'm walking in with his belt right here. And I'm walking in holding the four, uh, the four no primer cap ones and some extra ones too. And I'm, there were two that like could have been shaken. So I'm shaking them both as I walk in. And I walk in 
and I put the four no prime the four no primers in there. And then I like look at my hand and I notice there's one with a hole in the side. So I use that one next. And then I try to put one of the ones that shook in there, but it won't go in. And so at that point, I show Dave, um, I leave that one out because I notice like that needs to be cleaned. So I leave it out, I move I move the cylinder to a location. Good. Good place to pause. Good place uh, to pause. Uh, when you were in the room interviewing Real Ms. Gutierrez, did she, um, did she physically demonstrate that she was shaking two dummies at one time? Yes. Thank you. Good clarification. Did she show she was shaking two dummies at one time? Wow. Where you wouldn't notice that that one isn't in there. Yeah. So I move it to where you wouldn't be able to see that. And then I go ahead. I show Dave. Uh, he watched me do it too that time. This is before lunch. And uh, I walked out after handing it and showing it to Alec too. Okay. When did you show so it to Alec? Because that's not what he said. Yeah. Okay. Oh, before lunch. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then I proceeded from that one that wouldn't go in. I just set it on the cart after that. Okay. The four that you... Alec was not meant to pull the trigger or be pulling the hammer. Alec shouldn't have even had a gun with any dummies or blanks or anything in it when they were blocking this out. But he did. The, she's not the only one who failed on this set. That's 100% true. Multiple things can be true. Um, but yeah, Alec shouldn't have been firing it. However, had he fired it and it was just dummy rounds, nothing would have happened. So um, if she hadn't loaded it, it wouldn't be a problem. But without the primer. Yeah. Where were those pulled from? Uh, those were pulled from my pocket. From your pocket? Yeah. From my okay. pocket. So the other two. Making it more infuriating that the day of the shooting when she came into law enforcement and was like, oh, let me show you, and pulled out like a handful of ammo and plunked it on the table, that they didn't take it as evidence. They let her walk back out of the station with it. In absolutely infuriating to me. I'm also stunned that they didn't search her before she walked into the interview room because she could have had anything in like anything, but she out from her pocket, just from my, like, here, clunk. Wild. Corporal, um, when you interviewed Ms. Gutierrez on October 21st, she had some dummy rounds in her pocket, correct? Yes, she did. Um, Why didn't you take them in evidence? How many did she have? Uh, she had five, I believe. And do you recall how many of those didn't have primer caps? Uh, I believe four of them had the holes, but I don't remember how many. Would it be easier to remember if you had taken them into evidence? Maybe. Maybe it would have been relevant. In our primer caps. Okay. Um, I may ask you on a break to, to go back and review that, or I'll try to find it for you. Maybe they should have um, been in evidence. Is it... Is it your understanding on October 21st when you interviewed her that the dummy rounds that she pulled out of her pocket uh, were rounds that she had taken out of the gun? No. All right. Uh, so in addition to what she is describing to you now, apparently she had oh, they did five take them? additional I dummy rounds I didn't see them take them. I thought Hannah took them. Yes, she did. All right. I mean, if they took them, then they'll go over the photos of them. It looked to me like Hannah took them. I hope they took them at some point, but I might have missed it. I missed the very end of that interview. Remember about what time you loaded these guns? Um, not exactly. I would maybe guess like ten thirty for rust, maybe ten, and then for the other two, they were loaded like maybe thirty. I'm just going to make another reminder. We do have seventeen thousand of you here in the chat. Our chat's a little different than other chats. Um, as we don't go after witnesses for their looks, we talk about the things that they are talking about, how they testify as witnesses. Um, so that's just a reminder. And if that doesn't work for you, there's plenty of toxic chats around the internet that you are welcome to go be a part of. But this is a police officer doing their job and testifying in court. I appreciate that. Um, because that is how the law nerds do things. I realize some of you might be new and that's fine. Um, and if that's for, not for you, um, 
that's fine too, but just not in this chat. So thank you. We're going to talk about what this officer said and how she did her job and what Hannah Gutierrez Reed is saying and how she did her job. Um, and I know that's a little different than elsewhere on the internet. A few minutes before that. Okay. Yeah. So fairly early. Yeah. Pretty early in the day. Start super early. <laughs> when you broke for lunch, um, none of the rounds were taken out of any of these guns. Uh, no, none of those were taken out. We just put them in the socks and we brought them to the truck. And from there, we put them into the safe. Okay. Yeah. And then the safe loaded with them. With the dummies, yeah. Yeah. Still yeah, dummies. I mean, yeah. yeah. Just so we're clear, yeah, just with the dummies. Okay. And the other two guns were full. Yeah, the other two guns still were dummied up, yeah. And again, um, so and again, Chad, I don't think put these back in Chad, I don't think there's a problem with saying, uh, I like this witness's hair, I like this better than yesterday, but flaming them for appearance or telling people they're unprofessional for their appearance, things like that that get very negative is a little bit different. Hey, I like Tana's hair better today than yesterday. I thought it was more professional for court is not making fun. Um, but there are plenty of things that I have seen just flying by the chat that are negative and seem to be making fun. So that is uh, where the difference is. And I think all of you are nuanced enough to appreciate the difference. Um, and, and I get it. So thank you. Uh, Did my video no, just free? And then my video froze. My video is like, Emily, you keep pausing me. So we're going to just, what we're going to do is uh, freeze, which is a Emily issue, not a, not a chat issue. And yes, the witness knows, um, the witness knows that the, victim is deceased that helena is deceased and her lawyer brought her in for this interview i think you are more than welcome to comment on her I lawyer's Sarah decision Sarah was doing it at the time and i was kind of just down on the ground like handing them up to the prop truck because i had a really bad headache okay yeah so i didn't climb try to climb up there or anything because my head was like pounding and did you guys um take them to the truck with the cart or did you just carry them we just carried them Corporal, did Ms. Gutierrez tell you that uh, she was, uh, on October 21st, her head was pounding? Yes. Did she indicate she had a headache? Yes, she did. And, and just to be clear, the interview that we're watching right now, this interview was done... I swear if this prosecutor tries to make she had a headache into something more, I will lose my mind. She is in New Mexico. She could have been dehydrated. She could have had... There are so many things... <laughs> that could have been so if the prosecutor tries to make that reach i think it will be too much of a reach because i don't think there's actually facts to support it pointing out she has a headache is going to have to be the full stop but i worry i worry about it less than three weeks after ms hutchins died yeah this one was on november 9th thank you I'm really glad they circled back to the date of this interview because I hadn't heard that. Um, so November 9th. Yeah, and you guys are saying in the chat, and it could be, it's a very stressful work environment. <sighs> if she tries to connect that headache tomorrow, it's really, it's going to be hard for me. We left the cart there at lunch. And was all the ammo in that cart? Still? Yeah. And was there some in the truck still? So? Yeah, there's there's always going to still be, like, blanks in the truck because we want to never need to bring all of them out, okay. you know. How many boxes do you think are left on that cart? Uh, on the cart, I would guess, like, maybe hmm, I had some shotguns. I had some, I would guess maybe 10, 10 boxes. All on the bottom? or On the bottom. On the bottom, and then there was, you know, the dummies on the top that we were taking from. Okay, so just one box on the top. I think this one box on the top, um, I might have been preparing some things beforehand and dumped uh, some quarter loads into my fanny pack or whatever and left a box up there that was empty. Okay. All right, so after lunch, who took the guns out of the safe? Uh, after lunch. And now we are getting to after lunch. Uh, I don't think she said who put the guns really sure. in the safe. I don't really remember that too much. Yeah. I mean, it would have been one of the, you or Sarah, right? Yeah, me or Sarah. Okay. Yeah, like I said, I kind of had a headache and I was like getting over it, so. 
And they were all still in the socks? They were all still in the socks, yes. How do you know which ones to pull? If they're all... We leave the handles out. Of the guns? Yeah. Okay. And then also I set them... So normally, like, there's a bulk of them up on the very top. I'll kind of set them on, like, the side a where the, the rifles, guns? like, heads go if I need to access them quickly. And then there's, if you saw the gun safe, there's also, like, holsters on the side. So we would usually put Jensen and Swin, Wood and Drum's guns over there because they're the two sheriffs and they go together. Okay. And then we would just put Russ's gun, like, kind of below all the other guns, too. Okay. Yeah. Um, so when you pull them back out, did you guys check the rounds in them? Uh, we didn't. We brought them to set as okay. as they were in the socks still. Okay. Were they ever reopened? The guns? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not too sure. Um, I reopened the I reopened the rust gun. I'm not sure about the wood and the drum. Okay. Uh, Sarah was mostly working on propping those guys up. Uh, the rust gun I opened up after lunch because I remembered that it was dirty and I remembered that I was like, all right, we're about to start shooting out of it. So I go and I put the little cleaning guy that I have, I open it up, put the cleaning guy through, take one out of the box, shake it. Um, and at this point, after I had put the cleaning guy through, Dave's in my ear and he's like, hey, we need the gun in here. And I'm like, okay. So I start to bring the gun in there, shake it, put it in as I'm walking in and then I bring it to Dave, I show Dave like all of the cylinder and then I tell him it's dummied up um, and I say, all right, um, oh yeah, and he's like, it's okay, uh, it's just, he's like getting talked to at this point by the way too by Helena and Joel and he's sitting there and he's like, can you just hand me the gun because I'm gonna sit in with it and I said, Okay, and I showed him it, and then I walked out after showing it to him and handing it to him. So It again clarifies that after the wonky round wouldn't go in, she cleaned the cylinder, put in the sixth round. She says she shook it and then showed the cylinder to Dave Hulls, but did not take each out and shake them to show him and put them back in, which seems to be what the industry requires. And Dave Hall's like, can you just give it to me? And then... Uh, took it on to set, declared it was cold. And she said, you know, it was dummied up. So she also told him that it was a cold gun, meaning it didn't have um, any blanks in it. He was just supposed to be sitting in with it. Okay. So you clean it. They didn't need it on set for this at all, by the way, but it seemed that Baldwin yeah, wanted it on set. Because you said that you had put it on the cart. Yeah, I didn't pull that same one. Okay. Um, any issues when you put that round in that time? No. Okay. And I think it's because it was clean. So would you say it's your responsibility to check the guns after they come back out? They come back out? Like when they were brought back out for lunch? Um, yeah. We, um, it's my responsibility to check them into the actor as they go out to the actor. So not to check the rounds again? Um, I wouldn't really check it unless it was going to set. But, but it, it was going to set? Yeah, it went to set and I checked it with Dave. Okay. But you didn't check it with Dave. You opened it up and you looked at the back. You didn't check it. <laughs> Isn't it your responsibility to check it before it goes to set? I mean, yeah, but it was going to set. But uh, yeah, um, but I checked it with Dave. No, you just opened it up. You didn't actually reach. Isn't, okay. Isn't it their job to like check and check and check and check? Isn't that the, the job? Um. Hmm. Did you do any other, hmm. you know, I know that you have different processes for checking these guns. Did you do any other check on that gun? Um, I did, I did um, some barrel obstruction check too also because, you know, while that, while that round was in there, you're able to pull the hammer back slightly, look down the barrel and see if there's anything in the barrel for that. So I did a barrel check on that gun. And did you see anything at that point? No. Okay. Um, that round that you pulled out of the box. So. Corporal, do you understand the description that Ms. Gutierrez gave of how she was able to do a barrel check? Uh, that she pulled the hammer back a little bit to That's check That's kind it? of leading. Um, did she indicate, uh, and I'm sorry, did, if you recall, did she indicate whether or not there was a dummy 
uh, or, or whether it was the cylinder was loaded with dummies? Uh, she didn't indicate at that point. Okay. Um, Happy if, birthday, if a revolver uh, cylinder is loaded with anything, can you see down the barrel? You know, I'm not too sure. Okay. She's like, ma'am, I'm not the weapons expert. Um, that's a question for the weapons expert. But I imagine if the cylinder's loaded, you wouldn't uh, maybe want to look down the barrel. Last time that you loaded. Yeah. What did that look like? Uh, it looks like the dummies that don't have the hole in the side or anything. Okay. Um, did you notice anything different about any of the rounds that went in? No. I don't know if we're at Audacity yet. It's when it was Dave, right? Yeah, I spent it with Dave. I don't... And you didn't notice anything I'm torn. Different? Um, no, I didn't notice anything different. And four out of those... I was also of... getting talked at with Dave and everything, and I'm just mostly trying to show it to Dave. Right. Yeah. I mean, While also looking at it, yeah. Makes sense. Um, but the four of them still have the depressed primers. Yeah. Good to see okay. you, Stephen. And then the two didn't. Yeah. Okay. Um, how do you think someone would... Potentially put my Oh, Corporal, what's your understanding of? I like the pause. After this the is incident, important. Where the gun was unloaded. Um, so in Hannah's interview, um, she said that Dave Halls had brought that revolver over to her, and After it she happened. had um, checked and unloaded that weapon over the prop cart. Um, she and, did it. And have you? Uh, have you seen photos uh, of those rounds that were taken from the prop cart? Yes. Do you know, are there four dummy rounds with depressed primers? I believe there was. Thanks. Mm, I mean, the same way you would put the dummies or the blanks in there, opening it up and putting it in there. Okay. This is the question I have. I'm going to leave it here so we can circle back to this when it becomes clear. But she's talking about recovering. So apparently the the rest of the ammunition that was in the sixth shooter when Baldwin shot Helena Hutchins was recovered off the cart or they believe it was recovered off the cart because she took it out. But there were four dummies with depressed primers. That indicates to me, and I'm interested to see how this ties back around, that there is the potential that Baldwin... Um, fired or or cycled this gun five times four with dummies and one with the live rounds because if they had depressed primers something is hitting something is hitting the dummy round that's my question like th that he was pulling the trigger and cocking the gun not just this one time when she was shot but that it happened multiple times is i wonder if that's what they think this evidence shows um wild and for those of you saying um wait i saw this uh tessa said are you surprised her dad didn't tell her to lawyer up she did lawyer up her lawyer's sitting right there next to her her lawyer that did the opening statement he said he's sitting there in the blue shirt so she did lawyer up but uh uh they they decided that this was helpful so. um and you're talking about the dummy boxes what yeah the the box box. From that one. What do you mean? So I'm saying like you would, if you wanted to load this with a live, potentially you would just pull it back, half cock, and put it in there. I don't know if you but understood the question. I, I don't think I am. <laughs> yeah. So, but you Your lawyer just popped in and said, I don't think you understood the question. He could have been a lot more vocal than that. You said that you loaded each and every one of those rounds. Yeah. And how would you say that a live round got... In this Can you explain how this happened? Um, She's like, I'm not entirely sure if someone put li a live round into that box or not. Uh, I checked those to the best of my abilities. I was walking in, shaking it in my ear, mm -hmm. and I thought I heard it shake for sure. When do you think somebody would have had the opportunity to put a live round? Um, you know... Hard to speculate on that exactly, but you know, that gun, it was on Alex most of the day. Uh, and then also it was on top of our cart sometimes too. 
and there were times when I was gone to the bathroom, you know, and like I said, I got to pee, you know. Mm -hmm. So there were times the weapons were unsecured. I imagine other armors also have to pee. I think that's a very reasonable thing during a work day. I just wonder if other armors would lock up the weapons if they are not physically in possession of the weapons. It seems that that's the industry standard is that if the armor is not with the weapon and the weapon is not in the actor's hand with the armor there, that the weapon is locked up. Um, and I tell the girls to watch the card and everything, but sometimes the girls get distracted by the actors. Ma'am, you've got a set with Jensen Eccles on it. I mean, what are, what are you expecting people who it's not their job to do? It's not their job. It's not, it's not their job. It's your job. It's, it's your job to lock the guns up if you have to go to the bathroom. I understand that 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 seems like a lot but i asked the girls to watch and sometimes they got distracted by the actors is it their job is there are they the armors though in the box because you're missing that part of the question okay of how that could have gotten in that i'm backing up because i was distracted by the girls being distracted by the actors um i want to hear what bulls actually has to say because he's now questioning his client sure you know um, and I tell the girls to watch the card and everything, but sometimes the girls get distracted by the actors. Hey, Dan, good to see you. Hey, you need to elaborate in the box because you're missing that part of the question. Okay. Like how that could have gotten in that box. Um, oh, so, I mean, honestly, that box was sitting out all day. And when I picked up that box, I heard it jingle, like the whole box jingle. So that, to me, was saying, like, you know, this is a box of dummies, you know, still check everyone for the jingle. But so definitely some of those were 100% dummies. Definitely some of those were 100% dummies. Did you, did you check the box or did you check each one? Cause it, she seems to be contradicting herself and it's hard to tell, but Bowles is trying to narrow down the questioning, which I really appreciate. He's trying to narrow down, like, could something have gotten into the box? And she's like, the box rattled. And then she's like, I, I, of course, checked each one some of the times. You know, and ah, that was me. I don't know. Someone probably could, possibly could have done something at lunch. The box could have already had some live one in it in the morning. And you probably wouldn't have noticed um, unless you picked it up. Unless you shook each one. Um, Where's my chest? Yeah, I'm not exactly sure when that could have got in there. And honestly, it could have been in there from the beginning of it. Okay. Where was the prop cart? The prop cart, so that's another thing. The prop cart, like, moved um, significantly after the incident. Um, well, I mean, I'm not... Every that's not what you said in the last interview. In the last interview, you said the prop cart where you left it was at the same place it was when police arrived. What do you mean the plot, prop cart moved after? I have questions. The prosecutor also asked questions. The statement that Ms. Gutierrez just made that the prop cart had moved significantly <laughs> after the incident. Is that consistent with what she told you on October 21st? No. <laughs> I moved after the incident. Yeah. Okay. I'm not really. All right. Keep listening, well, Emily. You know, I'm a concern, but during lunch. So during lunch, it was still in the same spot where I told you guys, uh, you know, front of the church, the doorway here, your guys' quad car over here that I was sitting in, my little cart over here next to a black tent. Makes it easier for you. Well, that was actually the nothing she said. Kind of stop. Um, yeah, so about over here. I will say the lead detective on the case has done a good job of putting Hannah Gutierrez at Reed, uh, Reed, <laughs> putting Hannah Gutierrez, um, at ease at Reed at ease with this. Um, Hannah seems to be chatting with this deputy like she's a girlfriend, which is a very helpful interview style. When we see Alec Baldwin's interview, you'll see that she's allowing him to literally explain everything like, oh, Alec Baldwin, you're the expert of all weapons, everything. Please tell me all the things that you know. 
They all very much seem disarmed. Nobody seems on edge. And they're just like, can we walk? Let's figure this out together. We're all on the same team. They're not on your team, Anna. They're not on your team. Um, but they've done a good job of making you feel that way. And that is a, um, a, a very effective thing. I keep talking about the interview style, but she's, she's had some questions that are, are, are direct, but her interview style has worked very well here. And that's, um, really interesting to see because Hannah wants to explain and explain and explain and explain and help. And this officer is letting her help. There's no, the officer has no ego in it at all. It's just tell me more. And there also was a black truck there earlier that day. Okay. So oh, I'm right by that black tent. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm a little behind it because I don't want people, you know, touching it. Okay. Um, so Kurt's there prior to you guys leaving for lunch and is in the same spot. And Corporal, how about the detail about the black truck? Uh, is that something that was pointed out to you on the 21st, or is that new? That's new. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, OK. Um, where was the prop truck? Or is it that truck this way? Uh, Chat, you're very the smart. The prop truck. I appreciate you. The prop truck is doo -doo -doo. The prop truck's like all the way over here. So down at like the end of the town. Yeah, like down there. at the end of the town, like way over there. Right when we, as soon as you get in those gates. Uh, I know we have, uh, we have definitely giggled at the funny words in this trial because we get to watch this trial from the comfort of uh, the internet in our own spaces. But she's in a police interrogation room after someone has died on a movie set wherein it was her job to check the weapons and like, do, 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 this is over here is, uh, is, uh, is not, is not it, is not it for me. It's, it, mm next to the gallows at the cross from the gallows and I'm like there's a couple more okay cool which might help might not help but yeah tell us more where everything <laughs> is just go ahead and draw Without on these these the, will be exhibits <laughs> in your trial uh, I was like the hell anyway um she's so comfortable she's so yeah, comfortable it would be corporal do you recall what photograph you're handling you're handing her yeah, so um, I'm not sure who took these photographs, but we were able to locate some aerial um, views online of the rust set, which is what I was showing her there. Thank you. That's why, yeah, that's why we kind of keep a lot of the stuff on us because they don't like to move the process. I'm not going to speculate on that. I talked, FS, I talked about this a bit yesterday. I'm not going to speculate about um, any intoxication the prosecution is going to speculate on that and it's going to absolutely um infuriate me because nobody drug tested her and i don't think you can uh properly throw that out in trial based on the evidence that we've seen i will just reiterate i trust this department that if they believed hannah gutierrez was under um the influence of any substance that they needed to know about they would have tested her tested her with that so we have to just rely on law enforcement's observations. They are well trained in observing people under the influence. They did not test her here. So I am using that to say they did not test her. They were not concerned. So I'm not going to speculate on it. Um, but I think the jury will notice the difference in her demeanor between the uh, interview after the shooting and this interview. Though stress can accommodate for a lot of that. But the jury's going to notice, and they might be asking these questions, too. I'm just not going to speculate on it because law enforcement didn't uh, seem to take any action with that. So thank you for bringing okay, it up so it we can chat about it again. Far away. Uh, you remember where you took me to the bathroom? Yeah. Past that. So at the, like, very... Yeah, it was town. right, like, when you would maybe get pulled up and, like, the vans are there to take people. Yeah. That's where the prop truck usually stays. So you guys have to... Guns from way down there and then ring them all the way. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. It's like a pretty good distance. It's a pretty good distance, and then that's why we also didn't want to bring the cart all the way back to the prop truck. So it got left by that time. I think it's your yeah. job to walk, though. Um, I think it's your job to make the walk. I know that's probably a pain in the ass. No, nope. and we have with done long days, but I think that's kind of your especially job. Especially on like big shooting days and everything. 
just because we are out there like in the boonies with like sticks, snakes, all that crazy stuff. I get and it. And big rocks. So yeah, a few times we just left it there during lunch. Who all uses that cart? Um, just me, Sarah, Nicole, props. That's it though. Yeah, that's that's it for the cart. Usually people will try to set their stuff on there and I quickly. Why do so many people away. have um, some some people still like to put their stuff on it to rile me. Why is anyone allowed to put anything on the cart where the weapons are kept? Why? Why would that be allowed? Why would that be allowed? But yeah, similar in a joking manner. Or I don't know. They just like they know I don't like them to do it, and they still do it anyways. And you know, okay. yeah. Not so, you know. I mean, it's your job to tell them no. Them. Yeah. When you bring break for lunch. Mm -hmm. I mean, what about um, at night? At night, we bring the card in at night. On um, where does it go? It goes in the truck. Okay. Yeah. Um. So this day, there's obviously ammo. We've also learned that production was being incredibly um, cheap. They were being incredibly cheap on this set. She was talking about yesterday and in the part of the interview that craft services um, was total crap and that the craft services um, personnel had to fight to be allowed to make them soup at craft services because they were cost saving. And the cart seemed to be like a um, just like a Rubbermaid cart um, where other where the uh, dolly grip talked about other armorers had a cart that had locking drawers. So even when you had the cart or a prop cart or a weapons cart out, it would have locking drawers. So everything uh, would be locked up with that. So it's interesting. Some of that is on production, but then it's also her job to say, I cannot work under these conditions because it's you. It's like if you're an attorney and you go into court and your boss is like, do this. And you're like, at the end of the day, it's my license. So um, either you can go do that or I'm not going to do that. So it, it it's just, there are so many people that failed here. It's really frustrating to watch, but didn't lock the cart up at all and had no oh, way to. On it mm -hmm. when it was left out. All right, after lunch. I'm surprised that Seth Kinney from oh, the prop house know. that recommended her for this job didn't have a locking card. Uh, okay. Um, I'm pretty sure because we were getting into the nitty grits of it, you know, we were about to start shooting indoors, and ultimately uh, we weren't going to be seeing the horses outside, so I didn't bring the two shotgun. I bought one of the shotguns of wooden drums. And so here's the thing about that day. I was bickering with uh, the stunt coordinator all day because he wanted to shoot two pistols before every shot just to make smoke and everything uh, in front of the camera. And I was like, no, that's just like extremely uncommon. And he's like, well, we did it on dead for a dollar. And I was like, no, that we're not doing that. And but So as the armorer, you were telling people what was and what's not safe and acceptable. Good, good to know. I brought a shotgun. Uh, in case, like, you know, we could just do one big one if the director really wanted it. But we weren't planning on really doing it. It was just more of Joel, like, pushed for it. So we only brought uh, the rust pistol, the drum pistol, and the wood pistol, and then also a shotgun. Okay. And you guys pulled all four of those out at the same time? Yeah. Um, did anybody have to go back for anything? Uh, I know that I, I think... I brought him there, and then I immediately went to the bathroom after before we started getting into stuff. Okay. So I brought them to the set, and then I immediately had to go pee. Uh, did you already give Dave the gun? No. At so this point, no one had asked for the guns yet, and they were just supposed to be on the cart. Okay. Did in the stock. I cart? think they were probably supposed I to be locked up. I Sarah and Nicole, too. Okay. Yeah. And were they still there when? Uh, Sarah was flirting with Jensen, and I don't really remember if Nicole was nearby, but Sarah was pretty close to the cart still. Yeah. All right. So, three pistols, <sighs> one scared. shotgun, nobody went back to the truck for She doesn't have a lot of love loss um, for Sarah Zachary, it seems. I'm not entirely sure. Um... I don't think I went back to the truck, and I don't think Nick Sarah said. I mean, I know, Chad, we can't. Like I, I know, I Chad. I get it. I didn't really. But no other guns were pulled out? No. Besides 
slides before. They should have been pulled out now. Okay. Uh, what time did you come back from lunch? Uh, da, 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 da. I'm not entirely sure. Usually our lunch goes from 12.30 to like 1.30-ish. Okay. Um, what time frame do you think there was between when you came back from lunch to you pulling the guns back out? Um, coming back from lunch, you know, we... They've circled back round. So they, she... She lets Hannah kind of go on her her direction of filling in detail and then circles back around to like getting the guns after lunch. And she keeps bringing it back to that because Hannah's answers keep adding more. So she just keeps keying it back to, okay, what's happening after lunch without directly accusing her of anything. She's just opening up the conversation. Interesting. Get in the vans from base camp. So we probably take five minutes getting from the base camp to the set. And then from that point, uh, we hop right off of the off of the thing and we grab the guns and everything and we go straight over. Okay. Especially because like, you know, you don't want to be late. All right. So who, I mean, did you grab the cart, take it back to the prop truck, or did you just carry the guns? We just carry from when we came back from lunch, mm -hmm. we just carried the guns to the cart. Okay. Yeah, because we brought them there from the cart, brought them back from the truck to the cart after lunch. Okay. And then who carried what guns? Um, I'm not exactly sure. They were still in the socks, you know? Um, You'd know if you carry a shotgun compared to a pistol, though, right? Yeah, totally. Um. Maybe Nicole was holding a shotgun and I had a pistol and Sarah had two. Okay. Or maybe Sarah, someone's holding, like, we all kind of just had to hold, like, gun belts, props, you know, not to... I will say, with regard to the gun belts, with regard to the bandoliers or anything that had dummy um, bullets in them so that they could be seen, Sarah Zachary, the head of props, could have been dealing with those things. Those would count as props. So Sarah Zachary could have been dealing with the props. She should have been dealing with the guns. But it feels very lax the way they are dealing with the weapons. And I think that's where everybody, and I see it um, for the 18,000 of you in the chat, a lot of you are like, I'm so uncomfortable. And we're leading up to um, this fatal shooting with everybody being like, yeah, no, everybody was kind of just holding a gun. Mentioned like badges and things like that. So you're just kidding. we're just all trying to carry all the shit that we have to bring every time. Okay. Um, it sounds like working on a movie set is hard, ma'am. So that seems to be. How long but would could the cart have gone closer to the church? Because they were shooting inside. Took him to the cart. Feels like it could have gone closer to the church. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. And then obviously you have to take all these socks and everything off these guns. Who took them off? Uh, so like I said, I went to the bathroom at this point. Um, I'm not really sure if Sarah had started doing anything else. From that point, all I remember is that I remembered the rust gun was dirty, and so I grabbed the rust gun, took it out of the sock, and proceeded to do the whole cleaning thing I told you about. Okay. Um, all Which right. I thought it was pretty weird that, like, they immediately needed the gun in there, like, that quickly after lunch. Usually things take a little while for camera to get set up and everything, you know? Okay. So you thought things um, were weird. You clean the gun put that last round in it, and then how long would you say that took? Um, like she's, five minutes. Okay. Chad, yeah. Chad, Where see Chad saying she's always in the bathroom. She's retelling the same sequence of events in slightly different ways. So it's, it's all the same trip to the bathroom. It's the officer's interview style keeps bringing her back to, okay, so right after lunch, what are we doing? And so they're trying to nail down this timeline, but um, so it's not all the time. It's just, we're going over the same timeline and Hannah's telling it in different ways. And the officer is trying to nail down the, the timeline without making Hannah defensive. So that's, that's what's happening. That's why it, she keeps bringing it up. Cause we keep going over the same timeline to get more detail. Hopefully that helps. Excuse me. <laughs> um, if she just said, excuse so me, I need to go to the bathroom. I would have fallen that, out of my chair. Walks in with me and goes to Dave's try to show it to Dave. Dave's getting talked at. Um, 
Inside or outside of the church? Inside. He's sitting in the pew, and I think he's supposed to be Russ or someone. And from what I understood, it was just supposed to be a shot where, like, he's sitting there with the gun ready. And then also Dave was just sitting in with it, and then I was going to come back in whenever Alec got there. But Alec got there, and no one called me in. Okay. So... I wasn't able to do that last check before Good check. Alec Glad got the clarification helped. I had no idea that the gun had been handed off. And also, the video village, due to the camera qu crew quitting that day, wasn't working. So I had no way to see in there. Okay. So you opened the gun for Dave mm -hmm. to do the check. Mm -hmm. Inside or outside of the church? Inside. Okay. So it was it was open already because you know I put it in there, and I walked in putting it in and I just left it open. So yeah. you you were inside of the church, but you were loading the weapon as you were walking to the church because that sixth round wouldn't load. She said it was wonky, and the other interview cleaned the cylinder and then loaded it and is loading it as walking into the church. So she was in the church at some point. What did that check consist of? The check consists of me spinning the cylinder for Dave and telling him um, that it was gummied up. Alright. Did that gun go to anyone else? Is that, you know, did it go, because obviously it was in the sock. Did anybody else have a handle on that gun? After lunch? Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, not that I could tell. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, was did Nicole ever handle the gun? Mm. Russ's gun. She only handled it uh, the day before. Just like brought it down to me from the cart. Okay. So yeah. Not the day of the incident. No. All right. Um, so you give it to Dave, and then where do you go at that point? Uh, I give it to Dave, and I step outside because we're about to start shooting, and I was getting like all my stuff ready. Um, and also, he was. What do you mean by getting your stuff ready? Um, good, getting good my question. fanny pack filled up, and you know, getting my pockets like lined with different types of blanks and everything, because I have a pocket system where all the halves go on one side, all the quarters go over here. This is my dummy pocket, and yeah, and these are my empty pockets, and sometimes I use my butt pockets if I need to. So, like, uh, Sarah. Usually, I would just set the per my fanny pack up for her, even though I like to have both on me because Sarah doesn't understand the importance of pockets. But so I would, would set that up for her. And lies, lies, lies in this interview, ma'am. Every woman understands the importance of pockets. Every woman understands the importance of pockets. I'm sorry, I just needed a little levity um, because this interview is rough, rough. I would start getting my pockets and everything ready. So it's pretty common for you to put stuff in, like, your pants pocket, right? That's what you're talking about? Yeah. Okay. Common to put mostly blanks in there, yeah. And then also... Mostly blanks? Well, what else yeah. is in there? Like, you can't exactly just throw trash around and you eat stuff, so... It's just um, a lot of pockets, so that's why I like those pants. You can, yeah. So you hand the gun to Dave, and then did you see what he did with it at that point? At that point, uh, he was just sitting in with it and not moving it at all. Just holding it. Just holding it. Okay. And his finger wasn't in the trigger guard or anything. Um, obviously, this gun goes in Alex's bandolier does cross draw with it. Yeah. Um, which I was already Chad, worried I'm glad about we're all on the same page about pockets. Really with that much. Appreciate okay. you. Yeah, I texted his assistant the night before and wanted to make sure that he was comfortable with that, but they said that he was fine and that, yeah, they were going to figure it out and stuff. So, do you have that? Do you have that? Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Her lawyer just said um, we can just get you that. So, he was just sitting with it. Obviously, it's not in a holster. No. Um, did you see when he handed it to Alec? No, I was outside. Okay. Yeah, um, it didn't seem like that much time had gone by. I think I was outside for maybe like 10 more minutes, 10 minutes after I had handed it off. Pockets are exciting. That the incident happened? Um, yeah. Or? Before, yeah, and then the incident happened like 10, 15 minutes. This okay. interview has made me cranky. Um, so it's it's kind of infuriating. And give it to Dave. Did, was there ever... It's made me very did spicy. Did you ever make an announcement about it being a cold gun or anything of the sort? What did you explain to Dave? 
Uh, I told Dave, I said, the gun is dummied up. Okay. From lunch. Right. Um, let's go back to this little diary here. For Where were you standing? For those of you asking why her yes. lawyer let her do this. I was at my cart. You were at the cart when it happened. They yeah. thought it would help? I think her cart, I think we had moved it up ever so she slightly. She wanted to? I don't know. From that point. A little closer, um, or maybe maybe it was back there, and that truck had just moved. Actually, I'm not really entirely sure, but yeah, I was right there, and I was getting my stuff ready. Was this scene eventually supposed to contain? And I'm, I'm gonna say live fire, and it's not, but like blank fire. This scene, what we had been doing all morning, was supposed to lead up to the scene that we were, we were supposed to be doing blank fire in, but this particular shot was not. Okay, but eventually it would have gotten to that point pretty much. Yeah. All right, after the incident, um, I know that you had explained that you ran inside. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, um, the incident occurred, and I, like, kind of didn't... So the interviewer has taken her over the period of back from lunch, what's going on, back from lunch, what's going on, narrowing in on more detail each time. And now we are up to the shooting happened. She's not far outside the car or she's not far outside the church getting stuff ready and leading up to what happens. And I imagine we'll get the same interview style with multiple questions about what she did after, um, after the shooting happened, who handed her the gun, how she unloaded it, what she saw. And we're going to see it um, again and again and again really flinch at it even and Sarah said what was that and I said I don't know and Sarah said was that the gun and I said there's no way that could be the gun and then uh next thing you know I hear like on the in the earpiece like set medic emergency and I'm like oh what the hell and I thought it was like a popper that had blown someone's arm off or something um I have not watched these interviews, and the reason I have not watched these interviews is because I wanted to watch these interviews with you. I thought it was a popper that had blown someone's arm off, is what she said. Why would you think there would be a popper in the church when you saw the call sheet that said that they were going to be using gunfire? Like, the call sheet says what you're, what you're shooting. Also, you are the armorer. Could you not distinguish the sound of a forty-five long Colt firing? Did you not distinguish the sound of a gunshot? I have questions. So um, for those of you asking who's in charge of the poppers, it should be stunts is my understanding. But I don't, they've never clarified what poppers are. I really hope the prosecution pauses and asks the detective, do you understand what poppers are? Okay, because at this point, She's out just outside the church. Um, but I go over to the front of the church and I look in and I see people on the ground and I'm like, oh my God. And I said, was that the gun? And they said, yeah, it was the gun. And to which I go inside. I thought poppers had injured someone. I run into the set and say, oh my God, was that the gun? So you didn't think it was poppers then, did you? Scream. Uh, and then they yell at me. And then I walk back out. I ask for the gun. Dave brings me the gun. When you were in there, did you see where the gun was? No. Okay. I'm right. glad she right. asked for no, the gun no, to take fine. possession of it to uh, figure yeah, out what happened. So I'm, you know, everyone's kind of staring and looking at me at this point. Uh, and walking in and seeing that was... I'm going to back up. Everyone's staring and looking at you because you are the armorer, ma'am, and you were the one in charge of the guns. I mean, r reasonable. Did you see where the gun was? Everyone would like no. to know what the fuck. Okay. All right, sorry, go ahead. No, it's fine. Uh, yeah, so I'm, you know, everyone's kind of staring and looking at me at this point. Uh, yep. And walking in and seeing that was super fucking awful, too. So I kind of come I, out I, here. Yeah, I bet that's true. Uh, I'm, like, over here at this point, you know, kind of away from everything. They've brought me the gun. I take all of them out. The first one I take out has been discharged. Um, and it, like I told you, at first I thought it could be one of those old dummies. Um, but it could have been a live round. By all means, and once you showed me that 
uh, what they pulled out of Joel later. Yeah, kind of seemed more like that. Um, but yeah, so I pulled. It could have been a live round, and after you showed me what they pulled out of Joel, meaning medical personality took the met personnel took the bullet out of Joel's shoulder, um, then more likely, yeah. So at this point, she's acknowledging that this was a live round that fired out of the gun because she opened up the cylinder of the sixth shooter and saw that that had fired. So there would only be a casing left inside that um, cylinder all of them out and the other five were still dummies just fine okay uh so dave brings it out hands it to you is it open or closed at this point uh it's closed okay um hands it to you where do you inspect it uh you know it was like still really a situation to me so I'm sure. I'm right sure it was traumatic. Right Absolutely. When you opened it, when I when I checked the gun, I'm pretty sure I got it here, and like we had kind of walked away with it, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you said that you emptied the gun, right? Yeah. Where did you empty it? I took it out, put it in my hands, and then I handed them to Sarah, and I said, "Go check that fucking box. I got it from that box." And what to Sarah? The the dummies and everything. What did you want Sarah to check in the box? Is she supposed to be able to distinguish between dummy rounds, blank rounds, and live rounds from the box? Is Sarah is that Sarah's job? Because the last I checked, uh, that wasn't Sarah's job. But now we're getting back to some of the confusion with maybe the defense's opening statement that she said earlier in this interview and in the other interview, she took them out and put them on the prop card. Now she's saying she took them out and handed them to Sarah, which is different. And shell. So everything that you had in my hands went to Sarah. Um, just handed, handed it to her. Yeah. Earlier you said you put it on the prop yeah. cart. Um, just handed it to her. And uh, I'm sorry, Corporal. Just a point of clarity. I'm sorry too. What is, Ms. what is happening? Was saying that she handed to Ms. Zachary. That she handed the ammunition that she took out of the revolver to Sarah. Uh, is that consistent with what she told you on October 21st? No. Also, I would just like to acknowledge sitting through a three-hour video on a witness stand would suck. And I kept it in my waistband after that. Okay. You didn't go check the box? No, I didn't go check the box. I was freaking out. And Brian, my boss, came over at that point. And Brian took me a little further away to you know, kind of relieve people looking at me. And told Sarah, I didn't want you to leave that out. She told Sarah to check the button. What happened? Her lawyer said, I don't want you to leave this out, or I don't want you to leave that out that you told Sarah. So he's he's actively engaged in listening to this interview. At that point, and Brian took me a little further away to, you know, kind of relieve people looking at me. And told Sarah, I didn't want you to leave that out. She told Sarah to check the button. What happened? I said, check the box, um, and she comes over to me a little later, you know, while I'm off to the side, and I said, did you check the box? Um, and she said, and we also had collected the other guns, and Sarah took those as well. Uh, and then I was like, did you check the box? And she said, yeah, there were some bad ones in there. And I don't know really what that means. That's just what she said, and I thought, from the non-armor prop person, what does there's some bad ones in there mean? That meant like one or two. I need the prosecutor to pause and ask. Um, two, two days later, Sarah came to my hotel room after Helena Hutchins's one of her vigils. And uh, she came up to my room and was checking on how I was doing. And I asked her, I was all like, I was like, I can't believe somehow there were some bad ones in that box. And she said, she said, Hannah, more than half of that box was bad ones. And she didn't explain what she meant by bad ones. What? She said more than half of that box, she said more than half of that box were bad. Which, I mean, it's safe to assume that live. Okay. At it's that safe point, to assume yeah, half the box is live? It's safe to assume that half the box is live? Assume that those were live. So. Mixed in with dummies. When you emptied out the gun, how many rounds were there? There was six. Okay. Yeah, one had been discharged. This is very speculative, but it's happening. That one looked like? 
No, not really. Um, I took it out at this point, like, still pretty shocked. I'm, like, shaking just thinking about everything. Um, but so, um, I take it out. I pull all the others out. I'm, like, showing them to Dave, and I'm saying, like, no, like, the others are dummies. Like, what the fuck? How is that in there? And I just, like, look at Sarah, and I, like, after I said that, I was like, I don't know how that happened. They are all dummies except for one. And then I, like, look at Sarah, and I was like, go check that box right now. And I handed it to her, and so it was pretty quick, and I wasn't even, like, really looking at it. I was just more, like, looking at Dave and just... Corporal, do you recall on October 21st what Ms. Gutierrez uh, told you in terms of handing the box to Sarah and telling Sarah to check the box? Um, no, she didn't mention anything about telling Sarah to check it. Okay. Uh, so is that different than what she told you on the 21st? Yes. Freaking out at that point. How did you know that one wasn't a dummy? She is just um, checking I'm to see how sure the jury is reacting. That it wasn't a dummy. The looks that the prosecutor is looking over to see how the jury is reacting to the video. I would be exact same thing. Exact same thing. Still, I mean, now we know really that it could have been a lie around. But in my head, I was thinking that might have been one of the old dummies that the primer cap can pop it out. Okay. Um, but if it's a dummy, what's the primer cap popping out? There's nothing explosive in it popping what out? like it's not going through two people if it's a dummy that has nothing propellant in it those i don't know those still i haven't heard a lot of reports of those but i know that those did used to exist okay so after a gun was emptied i mean how do you well, mind if we take a break yeah i'm like can, yeah. getting sure. a little flustered yeah. i'm sorry oh. So she said, I need to take a break. I'm a little flustered. I'm sure this will cut if it's just a standard break. They're both checking work things. If they, I thought they edited the videos when there was downtime. No? No? Nobody? Yeah. Uh, Ms. Morrissey, do you know how much longer I'm wondering if we should take our bath and break? Yeah, and, uh, yeah, that's fine. And we, were, we weren't anticipating there being downtime, so we'll see if we need to uh, move the video ahead. Okay. All right. Let's take our bath, uh, bath break. Please don't talk among yourselves or anyone else about the evidence received here in court. Morning stretch right. break. All right, while we take our morning stretch, which we're all gonna need, I'm gonna fast forward this because we're behind real time. And we'll be able to zoom, zoom back to catching up in court. Uh, let's get back. Take a stretch. Y'all take a stretch break. And then we're gonna come back to live court. I think there's another hour of this interview. It's kind of a mess. Thank you all for uh, for not name calling the witnesses, for expressing your opinions with kindness. I think that um, that this is a difficult interview for for Anna. This does not go well for her. Um, she's absolutely trying to shift the blame. I understand that. So with all of that, it's um, it's a really bad interview for her because I think a, she's more empathetic before this plays in court, but B um, she she's showing that she feels comfortable and in command of her uh, work environment and her job, which is different than what the defense is trying to paint the picture. The defense attorneys are stuck with what she gives them in these interviews. And this interview is taking place with her defense attorney, but she doesn't, if she hadn't spoken, it wouldn't have it wouldn't have undercut their case. You know, if she hadn't said anything, she could have chosen not to testify. She can still choose not to testify. But this undercuts their case. And they knew this was coming. So let's uh let's continue. <laughs> 
it's fine. I just yeah. Like your poor dog. Oh, I know, right? Yeah. What? I don't think we changed anything. I, I, what did the my, my What did the court say? I couldn't even hear that. I think it's the audio. Uh, like your poor dog. <laughs> oh, I know, right? Yeah. Uh, I don't think we changed anything. I, I, my, my guess is is that when they stop laughing, it's going to go back to normal audio. Um, can we just try it and see? Sure, just a little bit. Okay. <laughs> They're okay. They're, they're outside, but they can handle it. They're, they're they can handle yeah. Oh, mine stay outside. No? Okay. Great. Yeah. No, I'm not there. I don't. I have a eight-month-old German Shepherd who oh, no, is... Oh, no. He's oh, right terror. Here. Objection. Really Objection. Have. Objection. Ma'am, you are not allowed to bring up that you have an eight-month-old German Shepherd and not show us pictures. I object. Where are the pictures? We need the puppy pictures, ma'am. But... Do you see how comfortable they are? Do you see how comfortable they are with each other? Um, as she comes back from the interview, talking about the puppy, talking about um, her life, this is why Hannah feels like their friends just having a conversation about this really fucked up thing that happened at work. Not that she's being investigated for a case that could land her with the charges that are here now, involuntary manslaughter. She thinks it's, it's just fine. And um, that's how you want this witness to feel because she's going to keep talking. She doesn't feel defensive. Um, yeah. Yeah. Really right now. Oh, yeah. Dude, Code really audacity for not showing the puppies. I had like a young one a few years ago and like she totally like chewed up all my panties and fucking trashed all my plants. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, I don't, I don't let him inside like... <laughs> I didn't have um, German Shepherd eating defendant's panties on the bingo cards. I am so sorry, uh, chat. I, 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 um, this trial is a. Uh... At all, yeah. He used pictures in the beginning because I just wasn't going to deal with that. Yeah. I normally don't creature my dogs, but I've only had huskies. And uh, so this is a first different one that I had and he's like he's like the most intelligent thing ever but he is like reckless yeah he wouldn't have done this yeah, interview he's insane. your German Shepherd knows this interview is a terrible idea <laughs> like, oh, man. but I got him because I wanted to breed oh well, yeah those are pretty oh yeah Mr. Bowles is perfectly comfortable shepherds. I like calling them Herman Shepherds I think it's fun <laughs> <sighs> <laughs> Pixar, it didn't happen. Yep. We all want puppy pictures. The Murdoch trial gave us puppy pictures. The Murdoch trial gave us puppy pictures. I'm just I know, right? Yeah, I literally stretched yeah. in here. <laughs> You'll see it. You'll see it. <laughs> oh, yeah, we won't stand for the puppy slander. Ma'am, you were irresponsible where you left your underwear, and that's why the dog cheated. Yeah, that's totally that's not on the dog, that's on you. Up. I know. I know. That's what I'm saying. I had in my oh. head. <laughs> I wanted to see what she said she had mixed up in her head, but she is so comfortable. Mm. Like, so. Yeah, I totally had you and Alex mixed up in my head. That's so funny. I know. I know. That's what I'm saying. I had these <laughs> guys, like, I thought she was Alec, and I talked to her, like, most of the time. Then I even realized. Mm -hmm. Uh, no, nope. that's Samantha. Yep, that's Samantha. Do you want another water? Corporal, who's the gentleman that just entered the room? That is Detective Joel Clono. Ma'am, that dude's been there the whole time. Is this a different dude? That dude's been there the whole time. He's just been taking notes. Um, all right, so going back to those loose rounds that were in your pocket, it's common for you to carry them in, in your pocket. Yeah. Um, I don't my know. Dad will usually, my dad usually carries a couple of, like, his favorite dummies, you know, like, good night safe ones in his pocket, and I do the same. But okay. we had um, three guns dummied up that day, so I used a couple of them on other guns. Okay. Is that why you keep them in your pocket? I think, uh, Ashley, I've watched a lot of law enforcement interviews. It's also an interviewing technique. 
to make people feel relaxed, which is why they're just casually chatting. Everything shouldn't be about the case. Everything shouldn't be about the interview. Um, you know, hey, what did you get for breakfast today? Hey, how are you doing with all of this? All of these things are part of interviewing techniques. And this is why people are like, you you um, get comfortable and forget what you're doing. We see this, this is a rough analogy, but roll with me for a second. We see this in reality TV where people are like, I got so comfortable in the environment I was in. I was saying things on camera and forgot that we were on camera. She's not going to forget she's in a um, police interrogation room, but she feels comfortable like she's explaining what happened at work, not like she's being investigated. And all of this is part of it. The um, detective came back in and was chatting comfortably with her and her lawyer. It's all part of... Um, it's all part of making someone comfortable because the more comfortable they are, the more they're going to talk to you. If somebody comes out, we saw this exemplified so well in Mr. Bowles's um, style of cross-examination. In some of the cross-examinations, he's friendly. Hey, but this isn't that, is it? No, but what is this, isn't it? But when he came in after uh, Ross slash Heisenberg, he came in hot and the witness was like, yeah, because your client loaded the gun that killed my friend. And you saw the fight in that because he came in with very pointed and aggressive questioning and it makes someone defensive. This is to open someone's conversation up and let them talk and talk and talk. And when they're talking, law enforcement will not stop the interview. They're not going to stop the interview. They're going to let them chat and chat and chat and chat all the chatting you want. Tell me everything you want to tell me. So that's why we're here. Also, yes, the chat's reminding me to do the YouTube thing. Thank you. There's almost 20,000 of you here. So do those things. Let's go. Yeah, because just in case. And then also I have another in the bag uh, on the bottom of it. You'll probably realize that there's also some dummies in those pockets down there. Too. There's I dummies keep, like, everywhere. A good 12 dummies. Just all over. In situations. Those are, but you're talking about those. Like bags, though, right? I'm talking yeah, about your pants. Yeah, I'm talking about my pants. Yeah, okay, yeah. I always try to keep, like, at least five or six in there. Do you remember where you pulled those from? Uh, those I came out of one of my old boxes, and we had been using them from the weekend previous. They came out of my old boxes. The prosecution keeps saying that Hannah Gutierrez is the one that brought the live rounds onto this set. And they've showed you the chemical analysis of the uh, shoot loops which Lyndon in the chat named the round, like uh fruit loop looking gunpowder and the flat disc hockey puck, like looking gunpowder. And one of those gunpowders is from the prop house. And the other gunpowder is from what was found on set. And she is now saying they came out of my box, which further supports the prosecution's theory that she is the one who brought those live rounds on set. They did not come from the prop house. Yes. And those were the ones with no primer caps. So did you have those in your pockets? Prior to going to lunch? No, those were, those should have been in, in the gun already. No, I'm talking about those that were in your pockets, so. though. Yeah, the, the four, the four without primer caps. Um, I think we pulled, I think you pulled six rounds, six or seven out of your pocket. No, I pulled, I'm pretty sure I pulled the four out of there and then I got the other. Ma'am, when you came into the police interview, it was more than four rounds because I watched you lining them up on the table and playing with them like they were fidget spinners. Other two from the box and shook them as I walked. No, in. I'm talking, so the, the night that you came in for an interview. Oh yeah, I had some, I had some extras in there. I think I found some more and I was like, I'll put some more in there just in case. But do you remember when you put those in your pocket? No, not exactly. Before or after lunch? Uh, I don't really remember. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. So then how come you didn't pull from your pockets to load that gun? Mm, well, I, I, like I told you, I pulled those out earlier, and I totally forgot that there were more in there. More in where? More dummies in my pocket. So you keep track of your ammunition in a way that you just forget where it is. Okay. okay. Clear. We're clear yeah. on that now. Um, I just have forgotten that. that they were there. That one last one that you pulled to load the gun? Do you remember checking that round? Yeah. And what do you remember about it? Um, it seemed fine to me, and uh, Dave was just kind of in my ear, and so I was shaking it, walking in, and putting it in there. Okay. But. And? Um, I just want to follow up on a few things. Okay, I would love that. Um, oh, 
you're standing. This is a big deal. What are we standing for? Uh, over the break, uh, did you have an opportunity to review some of the evidence photos? Yes. And did those refresh? Is this about what we were just talking about in the interview or have we jumped into something different? I'm not following. Ma'am, we've been watching a video for over an hour and whatever now. I What? It's your memory. Yes. Uh, the rounds that were found on the top of the prop cart, um, and, I, and I'm not asking about blanks, um, how many dummy rounds were found on the top of the prop cart, assuming this is helpful. Uh, we've gotten the, the true story that the gun was unloaded at the prop cart? Uh, there were three dummy rounds on the top of the prop cart. And how many live rounds were on the top of the prop cart? Two. And of the three dummy rounds that were on the top of the prop cart. Two live rounds on top of the prop cart. And that's where she's pulling ammo out of. Uh, did any of them appear to have depressed primers? Uh, one looked like it had like a semi-depressed primer. Uh, and what about the others? If you have ever described yourself as semi-depressed, there we go. You could... You, you too could be a primer. Um, that they did have primers. That did not appear depressed. Correct. And obviously the live rounds did not have depressed primers. Right. <clears throat> um, yes, were you the live rounds had depressed to, primers, they probably would have me. gone <clears throat> off. Were you also able to uh, refresh your memory as to the dummy rounds that Ms. Gutierrez had in her pocket on October 21st during your interview? Yes. And how many dummy rounds, uh, if you recall, did she uh, pull out of her pocket to show you during the interview? She had six, six total. Yeah. And of those six, how many of those had no primer cap at all? Uh, five of them had hey, no Rob. primers, and then one of them was one that she demonstrated the, the rattle, so the one with the BBs in it. Good to see you, Rob. So, you are now familiar with all the different types of dummy rounds that were on that movie set, correct? Yes. She's so, like, I've looked at so many rounds, ma'am. If Ms. Gutierrez loaded the gun with dummies and then spun the cylinder for Mr. Halls... Would this question be leading? Yes. Would spinning the cylinder enable him to know whether they're dummies or not? The only way that he would be able to tell just by spinning the cylinder would be with the ones that did not have um, the primer caps on them. Other than that, if they had a primer cap, he would not be able to tell if they were dummies. You have to take them and out. None of the rounds on the cart were missing primer caps. Correct. But she had five of them in her pocket. Yes. That presumably she did not use to load that gun with. Correct. She did state that she did not pull any rounds out of her pocket to load that gun. All right. Thank you for the clarification. Are we going back to the video? No, he was in my ear. Like, and oh, your, the, your radio. Yeah, there's always, there's always a fucking I people in my ear. Not the voices. I'm up here walking. There's always a fuck ton of people in my ear is what she's saying. And she's talking about um, the radio on set. Not the voices. It's a ton of people. And you'll see me a lot of times on set. Just take that thing out and throw it as far as I can. Okay. Yeah. So, you don't so when that's how I knew when the when he was telling me. Yeah, I don't remember exactly when those were in my pockets. And honestly, they might have been in my pockets um, in, a, in a spot where they aren't normally, you know. Okay. Uh Are you telling me the pocket not pal the pocket system is not perfect is that what you're saying you might have misplaced things in your pocket because that's maybe why other armors put things in like boxes that are locked maybe just um all right so i have some questions regarding like media statements that you guys have put out okay media yeah. statements um, and just so you know like one of them with bob got a little crazy and bob Yes. A media statement with Bob got a little crazy. They're approaching about it. I'm going to answer some questions while they approach. I'm not going to zoom, zoom. Um, Annie Moose said, you can't be a badass with a big personality if you're incompetent. I don't know. I think there are definitely some people in this world that have a, 
that think they are badass and have big personalities who are incompetent. But I think that's just uh, a thing, especially when you're dealing with firearms. I mean, I, I definitely think her confidence and her experience are misaligned. Boho Explorer said the fatal bullet was reloaded Starline brass casing that had been reloaded. There is a behind the scenes interview where Hannah says she is learning how to do her own reloads. Could she have made the reloads? She said she brought these onto set. Yes, she could have. Hey, Emily, do you know if Hannah Gutierrez will be put on the stand to be questioned? Miss Kat, so we are clear. Hannah cannot be put on the stand. She has to choose to testify. If she chooses to testify after these interviews, it's going to be very interesting. But she can choose to testify or not. That is on her. But the prosecution cannot make her take the stand. She has a Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination. She also could have um, exercised that right before these interviews, right? She could have chosen uh, to shut the fuck up, but did not. So she's trying to help. Sometimes helping doesn't help. Brandy Rose, good morning, law nerds. I can't get over Bowles' grin when Hancock was first on the stand. How does he think he's going to recover from this on cross? I don't know, but he seems friendly with the detective, and that's not uncommon for lawyers to be friendly with law enforcement. Um, it's just not going to go well for his client here because this interview is a disaster. It's just a disaster. What purple did you use this time so vibrant? I don't know if we're talking about my hair or my sweatshirt. My sweatshirt's from the law nerd shop. Uh, my hair, my hairdresser does. So uh that but water job yes uh froggy girl said i wonder if that's why bullion wanted to leave he realized that they're trying to lie and he wanted no part of it so glad that i actually get to catch you live today i'm not going to speculate about the attorney just because i really it would be it would be not even for me educated speculation it would be a rampant speculation but um i am curious as to what people hear as this keeps going i think she's saying alex as Alec Baldwin in the possessive. Maybe, Charles, probably. That's actually probably accurate. Mindy said, it's too early for me to be this outraged. Deep breaths. It's a difficult interview to listen to. And I think the delivery of the interview is difficult to listen to. I've got this at 1.25. This is a long sidebar. Let me put this at uh, a little bit faster while I answer questions. I think the um, casual delivery, while I understand the purpose for the interviewer of the casual delivery, it does come across and we're not sure how trials fluid okay uh, so um we're gonna take a break and um you'll have to uh wait in the uh, deliberation room don't talk among yourselves or anyone else about the evidence received here in court and uh when we think we're ready for you again we'll um tell the bailiffs okay thank you there's an issue with the next part of the video okay so whatever's in the next part of the video they're going to either have to redact out or zoom zoom through um it is what this seems for me but we are very far behind on live time i'm gonna answer a few questions and then zoom zoom why is her lawyer silent and just letting her talk i have no idea tinsley good to see you in the chat friend what i find interesting is the person in these interviews feels very different from the person we are seeing in court side note hey friend hey friend um yes it is and that is something that her legal team is going to have to consider if she testifies because it runs the risk of making her in-court testimony look disingenuous. I think she's looking at her cell phone, but it runs the risk of making her in-court testimony look disingenuous if she um, is not that casual and you can't be that casual when you're on trial, right? Um, let's see, Gen X cat lady does stuff. Can we get some love for the mods working to keep the chat show with almost 20K of us here? Yes, mod love always. Also, do the likey, subscribey things. Yes, do the likey, subscribey, YouTubey things. We do legal commentary right here. I'm a former prosecutor. I've been a lawyer for almost 18 years. They are definitely dealing with tech in the courtroom. Um, and also, when new when new folks find us, because I think we're um, probably on live trending at this point, but when new folks find us, they don't always realize that it's not uh, the, the Wild West uh, of a chat here. We are not a Thunderdome chat. And a lot of people just adapt and, and move on. And some people are like, I hate this and I need to tell you. So then we, uh, and then we, then we move on or <laughs> they move on. Cloak the librarian says she sounds like a spoiled brat. I kind of want her to testify to see how she behaves differently. She feels very comfortable um, and confident in that interview. And I can understand. I don't, I think um, we're seeing some of her confidence based on her, her lineage. She said in the interview yesterday, um, or was it this morning? Time is a construct. She said, oh, I they wouldn't want me to train in any of those classes. That was this morning. They wouldn't want me to train in any of those gun safety classes. My dad is the industry. 
I don't know how other armorers in the industry would feel about that. I imagine uh, they would have some thoughts, but my dad is the industry is a thing. Uh, so the prosecution and defense is still talking at the bench. Um, Emily, what enrages you breaks my heart. That's totally fair, Marjorie. To me, she appears young, vulnerable, incompetent. I think they hired her because she was the cheapest option, not the safest. So sad. I absolutely agree with you that they hired her because she was the cheapest option. I imagine when she was, uh, or when other armorers were asked about this job and told that they were going to be doing double duty as props individuals, that they said, uh, fuck no. Fuck no, I'm not doing that. If this is a gun, if this is a set with 17 days of weapons on set, what I'm not going to be is also the backup props person. And they chose her because she said yes. We heard in her interview she was trying to get into the union and she needed more days to get into the union, more working days. But Seth Kinney was supposed to be supervising her, yet we heard in testimony he was never on set. He was the supervising armorer, but was never on set. How do you supervise when you're not there? Like, it, it, you're not an accountant. No shade to accountants. But I mean, I figure that's something you can view remotely. But a uh, movie set with weapons is so much more dynamic. The helpful stranger says, I think she has to. She can't leave the jury with that. I think it gets worse if she testifies for her. I don't think there's anything she can do to fix it. Because uh, if she tries, she's subject to uh, cross-examination. Let's see how they were on a break for a real long time. All right. We're going to get back to court in just a sec. Uh, better to be thought of as guilty than to open your mouth. And move about, um... Charles Vance, it's very wise words. Better to be thought of as guilty than to open your mouth and remove all doubt is very, very fair. Chat, you're the best. Do the YouTube things. Oh, I owe you something. Chat, I'm sorry. I should pull up my hoodie and give a YouTuber apology. We binged at 175,000. I don't know. It feels like such a nice round number on the journey to a million. And I forgot to play um, the it binged. For those of you new to the chat, when the subscriber counter turns over, it actually makes a binging noise. Um, we've called it the bing from the binging noise that the counter makes since uh, before I hit 100,000 subscribers. And that's where this stinger comes from. Oh, it binged. Move your head. And now that we have celebrated, let's get back into court. Oh, did I say 175? Yeah, 700. Something like that. Something like that. It binged. Yay. Training days. You made a statement about how you wanted training days. Yeah. Um, who did you express that to? Gabrielle. Okay. And, and I, asked I think Gabrielle is Gabrielle Pickle. And I think that is one of the finance people working with the production team, but they're on the witness list. So she's now talking about wanting more training days. And I think her defense attorney probably thinks this is helping her explaining how production sucks. Asked about it to Roe and Gabrielle, right from the get go, I tried to start getting actors and everything to start working with me. Kind of one a day would have been ideal. Um, they told me they were like, well, no one really needs to get trained. You know, these are all trained people. And I was like, no, okay, whatever. I thought that more actors were coming in later and I would train them as the show went on. But then Joel called me and Joel was like, no, we need to train like all the actors. They're going to be there that first week. And I said, okay. So yeah. They the director was like, no, we need to train people. Good Joel. Good on you. Set up a training day, but I was trying to get them in from like the very get go. Okay. Yeah. But I mean, the statement was that you fought for training days. I did. So, um, yeah, Darcy, yeah, that was I, intentional. I was always pretty much arguing with Gabrielle and um, uh, for him. Because at first I didn't even want to have the training day, you know. Um, so. They're expecting people to just. Go yeah, no, they literally did not want to have that training day at first and they told me it wasn't necessary. And then after Joel called me, Joel told them like. For the plethora of civil lawsuits against um against production i think this interview would be helpful no don't be oh it's not us this time <laughs> just let me okay. don't panic see what happens we're having some technical difficulties the judge is like don't panic it's frustrating 
the tech stuff in trial is tremendously frustrating. It's frustrating for the lawyers and for the jury. It's less frustrating for us because A, we can zoom zoom, B, we are professionals here and I'm used to having tech issues, and C, we can answer questions. Apparently her lawyer doesn't know she's under investigation too. I mean, he's there so he knows she's under investigation. Um, eating undies, is that what GDS puppies do? I, I don't know. Um, she wants to meet up at gun safety class. She seems to not um, be licensed in any way with regard to gun safety. I'm going to keep answering questions. Uh, let's put this at 2x till we... Oh, I can zoom zoom, but I want to I wanna find questions and see if the judge says anything. EDB, she shouldn't have spoken on the day nor in this interview because it's a big shit show and she still has him as a defense lawyer. Yeah, I don't know if they realize how bad this is until you see how the prosecutor is going to change it but experienced defense attorneys and i think mr bowles is experienced based on the way we've seen him question in court experienced defense attorneys can see all the ways prosecutors are going to do things like it's not all that unique it's like oh you said this is the worst fucking day of my life prosecutor is going to think because you know you're guilty like that's and defense attorney might argue because uh you you're afraid your career is over and alec baldwin had the gun and you're afraid of him because he's the producer and he's an asshole on set or whatever like you should be able to perceive how the other attorneys will argue it um and that should happen i don't know why i paused that for this they're still chatting about the technology uh code runkle i didn't know we had a code runkle um didn't even realize it's been 13 months cheers in the chat why does her lawyer let her talk so much I don't know at all. Like, I don't know at all. It's odd to me. Could Hannah have hoodwinked Bowles into thinking this was not her fault? No, I think Bowles is probably a pretty savvy attorney, but I also think Bowles is looking at this like all these people failed. And it's true, he's not wrong. Two things can be true. Her job is to check the gun. But other people also definitely failed. So, I, I don't know. But it's his job as a defense attorney. I think he sees this as a defensible case because you can. There are so many other people to throw blame at in this case, and and right proper blame. It's not just some other dude did it. Who knows? It's actually these people also all fucked up, and didn't let her do her job. So she's not reckless because these people all fucked up. That's their argument. Bad Splinter said, as an instructor at a large outdoor gun range with three thousand members, this shit is frightening. There are so many ways people could have been hurt. Apps. Thank you for your experience and sharing your experience. And yes, this whole set is absolutely terrifying. How long is this going on for? Like, there's a lot happening in court. I'm going to, like, what are they talking to? There is, I am so glad we get to Zoom Zoom. I am so glad. Because uh, this is wild. Fiona, thank you for the gift of memberships. Uh, her attitude is shocking. It is very cavalier. Uh, yeah. And right, now they're on break. All right. Let's uh, see if they come back to court. Speak up. Come on. She's okay. okay. I'm going to put this at normal speed because we hear somebody talking. All right. Let's see. Friday Ketchup said, okay, the ammo was supposed to be cold, no ammunition, the rounds rattled, but... Speak up, come on. She's okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. okay. Better get going. I don't know what just happened. <clears throat> Something happened. Um, I don't know if that was the judge talking. That was odd. Uh... Brina said, question, is Hannah being sued or charged? I've only been following this trial since yesterday. Shh. Are they taking lunch? Looks like they're taking lunch. It looks like they're taking lunch. She she has been criminally charged. That's why we're here. Um, and court looks like it's on lunch break. What the fuck happened this morning? Court's on lunch break. I don't know when they'll be back. They didn't say, though. We're going to have to guess. Okay, no, it, everybody was grab, grabbing their stuff to leave. All right, let me let me recover for a second. Um, I'm going to go back to that last little bit where we heard just a smidge of audio, but it looks like the everybody got up to take the lunch break. They might have brought the jury back in 
to excuse them for lunch. Uh, let me put this at normal speed so we have it. But if they brought the jury back in to tell them they were going to lunch. Speak up. Come on. She's okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. okay. Better get going. <clears throat> um, Chad is saying in recess till noon. Okay. They're on, they're on lunch break until noon mountain time, which is in like 15 minutes, which means I'm going to have to zoom, zoom through questions and then shift our plans for after lunch. So thank you, chat. Uh, I appreciate it. Law and crime says Dave Halls is expected today. Um, this video should be done after lunch. If Dave Halls is testifying after lunch, that will be fascinating. They have Dave Halls on the witness list, among others. I'm going to, um, I'm going to just shift my setup around real quick. So, and then we will take a shorter lunch break here. I will still uh, break the streams up into two streams because A, it's better for the replay crew and replay crew, I love you. And B, it gives us all a second to take a break, grab some food. I will probably eat at my desk while we're finishing watching this so we can get through the afternoon. Uh, also, a reminder, yes, there is a court hearing happening in Idaho today. If court here somehow breaks early, if court here some, if court somehow breaks early, we will um, start a new stream and cover the Idaho hearing. If court goes the full day, I am staying here. Others are covering the Idaho hearing. I'll summarize it um, and see if we get a trial date in the Idaho trial later. I would just ask the chat, and I will ask you after lunch as well, not to summarize that hearing in chat because then it gets really hard for me to find questions on this topic. Um, so we're not summarizing what's going on in two hearings. It's very hard for me to follow. And then when we have 20,000 people in chat, people get frustrated that I'm not getting to their questions. And so if we're on multiple topics, it's very hard for me. So we will see what happens and play it by ear. Um, the Koberger hearing is going to be motions hearing, hopefully trial date setting, and we'll see. Um, but with that, let's give a quick summary and then answer some of your questions and then take a shorter lunch break today. Court has not been coming back on time. Bless, because... Um, because God knows I need it this week. <laughs> this morning, we have still been going through the third interview with Hannah Gutierrez Reed. That was um, the interview was done on November 9th, 2021. So not too long after the October 21st fatal shooting, but sometime after the shooting and after the memorials for Helena Hutchins had happened, the defendant has again admitted that she is the one who emptied out the gun after the fatal shooting happened in the church, that she loaded the gun before, that she showed Dave Halls just the back of the cylinder, didn't pull out each individual round and shake them, that there was a strange box of dummies that appeared on set and the box rattled and she said, I shook each one, but it was unclear if she really took each one out of the box and shook it. Because then she says later in the interview that after the fatal shooting, she uh, emptied out the six shooter that Baldwin had. She says she gave those cartridges to Sarah Zachary in a different interview. She said she put them on the props table or not on the props table on the um, prop weapon cart. But she also says that she told Sarah Zachary to go check the box of ammo she had pulled from that day that was supposed to be dummy rounds. And Sarah told her quote from her interview, half of them are quote bad ones um, so she assumed that meant up to half of that box of dummies was live rounds because they weren't shaking like a dummy round should because they should have a little BB in it. So, you know, it's a completely inert round. That was interesting information. That's not what's been determined by the FBI and others. But the fact that this armorer whose job it is to distinguish the bullets is asking the prop person to distinguish um, what all those are is very interesting to me. She definitely had some strong words for Sarah Zachary. It is um, interesting as we continue going through this interview, how perception of this defendant is uh, shifting. It's not a sympathetic interview. It is a very casual interview. She is very relaxed about the fact that she had ammo all over her pockets and some of it was in this bag and that bag and it was just kind of everywhere. And 
yes, she was in charge of the guns, but sometimes they didn't get locked up over lunch. And, you know, it just, it was a busy set and uh, she didn't lock up the weapons all the time. So it's not a good interview for her. It's the strongest evidence against her. And it's really the first time at day five in trial that we are seeing evidence specifically against her, where we're not just talking about um, how Alec, Alec Baldwin may or may not have fired the weapon. We're actually getting down to how did these rounds get on set? And Hannah Gutierrez read in her interview said she brought some of her ammo onto set from another project she had worked on. And we've heard a lot about that too. Let's get to your questions, shall we? Jill has said this case is everyone kicking the can down the road with tragic consequences, but if Hannah had a professional attitude towards her job and responsibilities, it wouldn't have happened. And that's what the jury is going to be asked to determine. The civil lawsuits are going to be there to parse blame on, on production. Like who's the percentage of blame is going to get parsed in the civil lawsuits. Not here. Hannah has sued. She dropped her lawsuit or the lawsuit settled with Seth Kinney, but she had sued him. It's, um, it's, wild stuff. Blue eyes, blue skies said her demeanor here after knowing Helena died is inexcusable. I'm angry. So sad for Helena's family and friends. Uh, let's say her name. Remember Helena. And that's the cost of this, the cost of this case. Um, Miguelina is asking what time to set the afternoon stream for. Um, let's go with one 30. And if I need to come back early, I will, but I think court's going to come back late and that gives me time to answer questions and time for everybody to eat. Thank you, Miguelina. Um, just her entire attitude is baffling to me. Yeah, she, yes, yes, she is very, um, comfortable in this interview. Isn't she is her attorney even doing his job? He thinks so. He never spoke yesterday or today so far. There's not much in court right now. There's not much for her attorney to do except wait for these interviews to be done playing. There's nothing. There's nothing. But in the interview, he should be, um, he should be stopping his client or or calling the interview. Like as some of this is coming out, he should say, you know what, we're not going to do this. Um, but he could have said that before they even went down to do it. I think they were trying to help her by giving the interview saying Sarah did this and Baldwin did this and production did this. It's I don't think it's going to work. The heart of this case is did she do her job recklessly? Chat, you can let me know what you think about that. Kara, now I'm really looking forward um to seeing her have a moment of knowing and realizing oh fuck i don't know if we will but we'll see when we get to the end of this and he said hey db do you think lawyers should have helped her plead guilty or beg for mercy this feels like poor legal guidance and not helping her stand up as an accountable adult i feel for her i don't know what's gone on in the attorney client relationship here i don't know what the prosecutors have or have not wanted to offer the prosecutors pled out dave holmes uh, so quickly and gave him like six months probation and a gun safety class. And you testify against everybody. Um, though if they had given her a deal and she had testified against Baldwin, I think it would have outraged a jury. Like if I'm a juror and I'm sitting there and the person who loaded the gun gets a deal and the person who loads the gun gets a plea deal and it all comes out on cross. Aren't you like, didn't you load the gun though? Like, why are you getting a plea deal? I, I don't know if there's a benefit to the prosecution for having her plea, could she have pled open to the court? I don't know if this court does that. I don't know if this court would have allowed it. I don't know if she wanted to plead guilty to that tampering with evidence charge that they put in there. It's a, it's a, in my opinion, based on the evidence so far, it's a, it's a real big reach on that charge. So I think she's in a difficult spot to want to plea. Um, Truly, and I don't know if she wants to try to clear her name. Miss Opinionated, thank you. Uh, you don't know what she's thinking, and lawyers cannot force someone to plea. They can strongly advise. Uh, they can point out all the all the pitfalls of a thing, but they can't make someone plea. ADHD said, uh, Emily, everyone who was in charge seems negligent of safety in some way. I agree. Um, the only people with any sense left the set. I think there were a lot of people horrified on this set. And um, it's just shocking what happens. But also, if if lack of safety on set is, can get normalized, I don't know if that's true or not, I don't work in this industry, then people don't necessarily feel like they can walk off. But Hannah should have. 
Um, it's very, very difficult. Very difficult. Um, let's see. Caroline said, I'm not sure she should be in prison. I definitely don't believe she's the only negligent person. She's definitely not on this set, but she made numerous mistakes and failed to do her job. She did. Probation is an option in this case. Probation is absolutely an option in this case. Prison is also an option in this case. And it's hard with the but for, like, but for her loading a live round into this gun, this doesn't happen. But for Baldwin pulling the trigger and the hammer, this doesn't happen. And that's, that gets parsed out in civil. Kelly said, why did they decide, why did they decide about possible drug charges? Uh, the white bag, she was curious, trying to get back. I really don't know. They they did it as a tampering with evidence. I, we're going to have to see more evidence on it. I think it's a reach. I don't like it. Like, that's where I'm at right now. I don't, I need to see. Is Hannah still suing Seth Kinney? That is settled or or she dismissed it, but no. But there are other civil lawsuits that they're all involved in. There are many of them. So another not boring morning. I mean, this interview is wild. Uh, Helena said, did you notice her necklace? Do you think she chose to wear a the gold donut from the bullet. I didn't, I did not notice her necklace today. Um, Alexandria said, I have a friend in the stunt side of the industry. I've been texting him the highlights throughout the trial. And his most common reply to me is, ah, and what the fuck? I think everyone in the industry is watching this case going, how does this happen? What the fuck is going on? Hopefully, and I, hopefully it reminds everyone on set that um, if your job is compromised by those around you and you are not able to do your job safely, you don't have much of an option but to walk and your union will have your back if you do. There's not much you can do. Um, and if somebody else comes in and is like, I'll do the job less, cheaper, uh, carelessly, you've walked and you've you've raised the red flag, you've sounded the alarm and you've done the best you can and you're supported in that. After this case, someone saying this set's not safe, you absolutely have the right and always have to put your foot down. And I hope it will be heard because it seems like Dave Halls is not hearing shit on this set. Question, while Dave Halls is partly responsible, do you think they offered him a deal because he actually showed remorse compared to Hannah and Alec? I think they offered Dave Halls a deal to get to Baldwin. That's what I think. I don't like the Dave Halls deal. I don't, and I don't like the Dave Halls deal based on the other civil lawsuits, based on the fact that having safety meetings was his job, based on the fact that other cast members went to him or crew went to him and said it was unsafe. He's the safety coordinator. It's his job that he didn't back up Hannah when she said, I need more training days. I need more armor days. I don't have enough to do. He was in the better position of power to stop some of this. And he absolutely 100% did it. He saw the writing on the wall and went, can I plea for a misdemeanor? And he pled for a misdemeanor. Why is Hannah so giggly and non-concerned during this interview? She feels very comfortable. I wonder if both she and her lawyer were under the impression that the cops were investigating Alec. I, I am sure that they were. Or that they were just trying to close the case. Um, involuntary manslaughter is not often charged. It's not an easy charge. Juries don't always like it. I think in this case, juries will understand. Some involuntary manslaughter cases, you're like, that's an accident. What? Why are you charging that criminally? Um, but when you have so many people being negligent in their job, I don't think the jury is going to be mad about this. I think they're going to be like, why didn't you do your job? Um, crime solver said, if I pause to give her the benefit of the doubt, can this weird overconfident consultive approach be a trauma response? Sure. Could be sure. Could be. Um, but you know what they rarely do in criminal trials is explain trauma responses of defendants. Sometimes with victims, they will try to explain trauma responses. Juries don't always respond well to that either. But sometimes with victims, they will try to explain trauma responses. Um, it's they don't always explain trauma response to the uh, uh, to the defendant. They just attribute to the defendant intent. Um, it seems this was a messy armory. Safety and securing the guns was very lax. All everything was very lax, and that's some of that's absolutely on production. And some of that's on Hannah for not putting her foot down. At this trial, it's about Hannah. In the civil trials, it's about production. In Alec Baldwin's criminal trial, they're going to try to make it about Hannah, and the prosecution's going to try to make it about Alec. And we're going to hear them talking about half-cocked guns a lot. Celeste said, I feel like after showing this interview, Hannah definitely needs to take the stand to show the jury a more sympathetic and compassionate side. The only one who can explain trauma response really in this case would be her taking the stand. That's uh, for sure. I checked the stove that I haven't used in months more than this girl checks her ammo. 
<laughs> That's so lazy. That's fair. Um, hold up. Is she now saying her stuff was messed with? The police were asking her about that. The police kept asking, could someone have, and I think they were genuinely trying to find out because the camera crew walked off the, right as this was happening. I think law enforcement had to keep the possibility open that somebody had beef on this set because it seems like too many things failed for this to happen. It feels too coincidental. Um, EDB, please, where can we find your review of the OSHA report? I know it's on the playlist for the Rust case. Um, we'll put it in the descriptions of the videos uh, after lunch, we'll find it and put it in the description. We've got, the team's got a lot that they're working on. We will put it in the descriptions of the video, which video it is when I have a chance to find it. Unfortunately, my flight tomorrow morning leaves, um, at the top of the 5 AM hour because I am an idiot when I book my travel. And I thought that somehow, um, in an alternate universe, that's a great time for Emily to travel. And, uh, so I have to leave my house at like 3 30 tomorrow morning. Um, and I have not packed yet. So today's going to be a, a long day, but we will try to find it. That was a lot of exposition. Sorry. Uh, is it possible since two people were on armor or duties, she didn't know live ammo was mixed in one person was on armor or duties. The prop person should not have been doing any of that. Why Sarah Zachary, if Sarah Zachary really threw stuff away, why she wasn't charged, but maybe now we're seeing why Sarah Zachary wasn't charged with, with, uh, tampering with evidence because of this interview of Hannah Gutierrez's right. Teeny, um, Kitsun. 038 said, Emily, I'm living for your comments at work. I can't believe her lack of awareness for how important her job was. Same. It feels like she grew up around it so much that she was like, it's fine. Steven said, so cavalier in this interview. She didn't even try to filter her answers. Yep. If my lawyer didn't tell me to shut the fuck up, I would have shut the fuck up. I'm not giving you evidence. And she might have made their case for them. She might have absolutely made their case for them. Um live for trial days with or live for trial days with the adb hey chat send good vibes and prayers that i get my adhd meds today darn the shortage the adhd med shortage is awful um miss and scene said i am a film professional and knew people who walked off this set lack of budget creates a very unprofessional environment very quickly lack of time creates a rushed environment this was so preventable uh, thank you for sharing your expertise. I agree. This was so preventable. It's the thing that frustrates me about this case. You look at it and you're like, if this person had done this, this wouldn't have happened. If that person had done that, this wouldn't have happened. There are so many checks and balances, but then we need to look at why people felt so crushed because of, of budget. Like if you can't make the film you want to make in the budget, then you can't make the film. Like if you can't make it safely, you can't make it. Shauna Michelle said, should bulls interject during the interview? Probably. Um, but I, you know, he thinks what he's doing is helping. I'm sure. Uh, Tracy said, I need to know what kind of purple. Oh, I think I answered this earlier. I don't know. I need to ask my hairdresser. Can her attorney be punished for making false statements and opening statements? Uh, not really. He believes the evidence will show this and that. And now she's saying I handed the bullets to Sarah Zachary. The only way you really get punished for that, if it's egregious, you can be sanctioned. It's rare. But the way you get punished for that is the jury going, you told me Sarah Zachary emptied the gun. Your client's now saying she emptied the gun. Sir, I don't believe you anymore. Uh, the jury will definitely hold you to account. So I think we've answered that. Listening to Hannah Gutierrez talks reminds me, uh, I don't, I, I'm impartial to that word. Um, she's very flippant and casual during the interview. These interviews send her to the gray bar hotel. They sure might send her right to prison. Roy said, my mind has been changed. She's negligent and I am all for jail time. We're going to ask that when these interviews are done. If it, if your, if your thoughts have changed on this case throughout the last five days, love that I get to spend my 34th, 34th birthday with you. Cheers, Brie. Um, someone died. How can she be so blase? I don't know. I mean, it's not the first time I've seen a criminal defendant be like, yeah, stuff happens. Uh, Daryl Brooks was like, yeah. And I mean, we can see that can Russ production company be criminally charged. No, they cannot. Members of the production company don't have liability here, but no, a company can't be criminally charged. They're being sued up one side and down the other. And, um, that's why you create a new company for each production. Cause that company won't be able to get insurance again. Um, I don't think Hannah could ever work on a movie set again. I don't think anyone would insure a movie set with her working on it. 
Uh, Susan said, it's my second birthday watching EDB. Thank you, Emily and Law Nerds, for being something worthwhile on the internet. You're welcome, Susan. I think that we have a great thing going here with chat and law and ridiculousness and FBI agents um, whacking guns with mallets. Like, this is, it's wild. Karma Kit said, question, was Dave Hall's deal offered by the pro by this prosecutor or the one before? The one before. The one before. Um, which is hard. So, um, let's see. It was, hey, B2, good to see you. It was testified that the ammunition was considered a prop and fell under her purview. Firearms were under the armors. Yes. So, but they were talking about, like, the ammunition was under props for putting it in the bandoliers and things like that. But once it was going into the blanks the blanks were the armors and like the dummies were the prop masters there was there definitely was some testimony about overlap we need like a real expert to do that not the prosecutor trying to shoehorn a percipient witness into being an expert charles said her first interview is more present sense jury got to give more weight to that version um the gave to sarah version feels cooked up it's definitely done in hindsight uh, EDB, is there a reason that they chose to show the entire interview and not cut out parts of it as a juror? I wouldn't be able to pay attention the whole time. Yeah, I think there's always a concern if you cut the interview that the defense counsel will get up and be like, hey, uh, deputy, did you ask her that? Yeah. Oh, we didn't see that in the interview. And then it can be painted as if there's something being hidden. And I don't think you hide anything from a juror unless it is, um, unless it is not proper evidence to come in. Like you're editing out things that actually cannot legitimately come into trial. Other than that, uh, you don't want to seem like you're hiding anything. They just need to see it. Kelly said, Runkle was stealing your facts, not fuckery all night last night. Well, I've definitely said pigeon business. Um, I don't own the word facts or fuckery, but them all together, I also, you know, we all know each other. So we all, we all pick up each other's languaging. Um, and that doesn't bother me at all. Like Queen says, the way she talks, you think she was talking about vacation with her parents. Yep. Um, and that might be, again, that might be distancing so she can talk about it because I don't doubt for a minute that for this 24 year old armorer walking into that church and seeing two people shot and people screaming, um, because that's what we've seen in the civil lawsuits, people screaming about it. Uh, Ian wasn't, I don't think Ian's stealing anything. I think um, it's a great word. It's a great phrase. And I would never worry about that at all. Um, you know, she walks into this chaotic scene in the church with people staring at her like she's to blame because armor, people screaming and people shot. It's, um, I'm not surprised that she's traumatized by this. And, and I do have empathy for that, but also it was her job. So there's, that's the push pull of this. And so some of this behavior might be her distancing, but that's not how it's going to be explained by the prosecution. And that might not be how it's perceived by all jurors. So, and it's not even how it's perceived by everybody in the chat and that's okay. Um, it can be perceived differently. And unless she testifies and explains what her state of mind was, they're going to be allowed to perceive it how they choose to perceive it because the prosecution's not going to try to be like, this is a trauma response. She's not the victim. She's the one they're trying to put in prison. They are going to paint it negatively. So that, um, I'm pretty sure instead of I'm certain irks me, uh, I, I, I don't think she was very precise with her work. How much time is Hannah looking out of guilty? It's, uh, on the involuntary manslaughter. I think the max is 18 months. Um, and based on what I read on the code, I think it's another 18 months for the tampering. Um, but I don't know if she would get both of those. This is a first offense. So up to 18 months. So she could get less than that. She could get probation. Is there, oh, we answered that. Let's see. And I'm going to go to lunch in just a second in her first, cause I have factor in the fridge. So it'll be quick for lunch today. In her first interview, she said she did not check the guns after lunch because she checked them before and it wasn't necessary. They were in the prop truck that may or may not have been locked. And now she's kind of saying they're doing this other thing. Um, Emily, do you have someone screen recording the Coburg hearing? Yes, we've got it handled. Thank you, Gia. And yes, I hate that the judge does that. Thank you very much for um, keeping an eye on taking care of us. We've got it. Boop the smoot. Yesterday, she said Sarah emptied it, didn't she? The defense attorney said it, but I don't think she did. Um, let's see. 
her like, lack of empathy in the videos yesterday and today is honestly sickening. And I think a lot of people are going to feel that way. Nights who say me, will Alex interview be part of this? I don't think it's relevant. I would need to know how it is. Um, EDB, someone said the same thing you said about her knowing the difference between a gunshot and uh, you know, if, if it's other lawyers commenting on the internet, cause there are lots of us. Um, it, it doesn't surprise me when we are on the same train of thought because we do the same job and it is the same train of thought. It's like, they, this is your job. How do you not know the sound of a gunshot? So that doesn't surprise me at all. Um, at all. There are no winners in this trial. Agree. I have questions though. That is true of, I think most criminal trials, truly most criminal trials. Um, there's no winner in it. I'm going to answer two more questions and then we're going to go. Um, the vibe of this interview only makes sense if both Hannah Gutierrez and Bowles think she has immunity already. Um, immunity deals <clears throat> are very spelled out. They are um, very formal. So there is no way they think they have any kind of a deal in this. Or they would be screaming at the judge prior to trial that the prosecution um withdrew a deal after she spoke and that these statements can't be used. Normally, if you give a proffer in expectation of a plea deal and or in expectation of immunity and that does not go through, the proffer cannot be used. <clears throat> and if you if you mess that up, you're gonna end up um with your case getting overturned if you use it. That's what happened in the Cosby case. Uh you can't you cannot that is something you cannot fuck around with. In your professional opinion, is this a defense tactic blessed in Texas. I'm sorry. I don't know what we were talking about. Cause it, I don't, I don't know where we're at. Is it a defense tactic tactic to just let her talk? Probably not. J Michael said with this in the search waiver, could there be a case for ineffective assistance? No. Uh, these are all, everything that the defense has done is going to be seen as strategic decisions. Even if we don't understand the decisions, they are not ineffective at this point. They are, they are doing their job. We might just not agree with what we're seeing or be confused by it, but they have a reason. Defense bears some response, a uh, defendant bears some responsibility, but seems everyone treated her like uh, her job wasn't important until it's the most bleeping important job on set. I think it's the most important job on set when you walk on set. And if people weren't treating her like it's important, she has to either demand that or, or do something else. Cindy, why? I'm so glad to hear it. Um, Let's see. I am burdened at work and my memory is bad. Could I be a witness if my memories are prone to change if someone pressures me? That is a very long and whole different conversation that I don't think I have time to answer today, but it unfortunately the best answer is it's really going to depend situationally. Why didn't her lawyer shut this down? I have no idea. This interview needs to be taught to new lawyers as what not to do with your client and custodial interrogation. I'm sure plenty of lawyers are watching it. Is Seth sued as she was working under his license? I don't remember every defendant on all the civil cases. I know he's, he was sued by her, and I think he's on some of them. Um, Ashley Wright said, my husband was on a film set. <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry about that. The armor made it a long day due to caution. The fact that the... This larger budget set couldn't do the same cost them on their life. Her attitude is just crazy. Yeah, she she could have. Armors are supposed to be like lawyers. You're supposed to say no all the time and then triple check things. Uh, Ann Bell, thank you so much. At 3 a.m., my cat wanted to go out. I looked at Kat and said, <laughs> what we're not doing, what we are not going to do. Cats are funny that way. I have to go feed mine. Bowls, that's it and the interview, but no, nah, I feel like it. Um... Morse Cat said pre-trial, I thought the majority of the fault lay with management for creating a bad situation. Currently, I think the fault lies with management for not firing someone so clearly incompetent or for hiring them in the first place. And that's really what Ross was saying uh, the other day, truly. Has she never watched Law & Order? Maybe not. Or YouTube, apparently. All right, chat. We only have like 15 minutes for lunch. So I am going to have to zoom, zoom, and probably eat on screen. Um, I need to go get some other water. I will see you guys back in a minute. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being Lawnards. Lawnards! Um, this will direct you to the next screen. If you want to chat, go get your lunch. Let us know in the chat what you're eating for lunch or whatever meal it is wherever you are in the world.
Bye. You can stay up to date with everything I'm covering and fast notifications on our free iOS and Android app at lawnerdapp.com or search the app store for Lawnerd. You can also follow me around social media and don't forget to check out my podcast, The Emily Show, with quick bits dropping every Monday, summarizing everything I do here on the live streams on Tuesday and Thursday for when you just have time for the quick bits. Thanks for being a Lawnerd. Nerd.